After World War II, the specter of communism haunted Italy's ruling class. The Partigiani, or the Partisans, which had defeated the fascists and killed Mussolini, were mostly communists. The popularity of communism was exploding. During the end of the war, the Communist Party of Italy had more than doubled in size. They would gather about 150,000 armed people. And in 1944, over 500,000 workers in Torino, waving the red flag, shut down the factories for over a week despite brutal Gestapo repression. The Communist Party became the second largest party of Italy already after World War II, attracting over 2 million members by 1947. It became the largest Communist Party in the West. Post-war Italy was close to become the first Communist country in Western Europe. The Italian bourgeoisie in the US, which was now by far the dominant capitalist power in the world, had to come up with something quickly. The history of Italy during the Cold War is one of the most fascinating periods because it shows how fascism was never really defeated. It just went underground, waiting to re-emerge and once again save the wealthy from the red tsunami of the proletariat. In what sounds like fiction created by the Assassin's Creed II producers, the ruling class established a secret network involving Freemasonry, the Mafia, the Vatican, the business and political establishment, and the CIA to fight and crush Italy's communists. The Italian Parliamentary Commission published a report in 1992 concluding that members of the so-called Gladio were armed bands supported by the CIA through funding and weaponry to weaken the Italian left. This is the second video on the Italian fascist movement, which is part of a series I'm making in light of the likely win of Meloni in the coming general election on September 25th on Sunday who is about to form the most right-wing government of Italy since Mussolini. Meloni's party, Fratelli d'Italia, has never clearly broken from its fascist past. And this past, which we are going to talk about now, is one of the bloodiest, most chaotic and most mysterious periods in the modern history of Italy. After the fall of the fascists in 1945, various Mussolini supporters aimed to reunite different elements of fascism and formed the Movimento Sociale Italiano, the Italian Social Movement, or the MSI, in 1946. For initiates, MSI also stood for Mussolini Sei Immortale, Mussolini You Are Immortal. Most of the leadership of Meloni's party today comes from the Alleanza Nazionale, National Alliance, which was itself a successor of the Italian social movement. This legacy is reflected in the party logo. The tricolor flame is supposed to represent the eternal flame on Mussolini's tomb. Its leader, Giorgio Almirante, was chief of cabinet of the Minister of Culture in the Italian Social Republic, the Nazi puppet state headed by Mussolini from 1943 to 1945. For decades, the MSI was the main hub for European far-right currents, becoming the fourth largest party in Italy by the early 1960s. In 1960, Italy even had former black shirts and fascist party member Fernando Tambroni as prime minister, who came to power through the support of the MSI. Massive anti-fascist protests followed, which were coupled with calls to finally beat fascism in Italy. How come fascist movements were still so popular in Italy after demonstrating an oppressive, vicious, racist and anti-Semitic regime in the recent past? Italy never really conducted proper defascistization. To this day, there is quite some continuity that survived from the fascist period. Plans to punish the fascist regime and purge elements of the former bureaucracy were abandoned, supposedly in order to not destabilize the state. Amnesty was granted to all major fascist leaders. There was no serious attempt to punish all collaborators and profiteers in industry. 
The US also undermined defascistization efforts. Virtually all the fascists that weren't shot by the anti-fascist partigiani, the partisans, were either reintegrated into the political structure, for instance joined the MSI or the Liberal Democratic Christians, or they joined the Italian police, secret service, or secret anti-communist networks such as the infamous Gladio, set up by the US, which we'll talk about later. Rodolfo Graziani, who was the worst fascist war criminal second only to Mussolini, was never prosecuted by the UN War Crimes Commission. He could freely work with the MSI for years until he died of natural causes at age 72. It's imaginable that Mussolini would have been spared as well if the communist partisans hadn't shot him. The United States implicitly supported the initiative to keep former fascist administrators in positions of power, not only within the liberal parties, but particularly in the military and secret service. We will soon see why this was done. President of the Commissions on Race during the fascist government, Gaetano Azzariti, even became president of the Constitutional Court in 1957. Former head of the fascist secret police, Guido Leto, was reinstated to reorganize Italian secret service and later served as technical director of police schools. With the approval of National Security Council Henry Kissinger, the American ambassador Graham Martin gave $800,000 to military intelligence leader Vito Micheli to keep the Italian Communist Party out of power. Micheli was later a deputy of parliament for the neo-fascist MSI and a member of an infamous secretive network. Within the Christian Democracy Party, there was never an uprooting of fascist figures that were reabsorbed after the war. Leader of the MSI, Almirante, an open fascist, would meet with the US National Security Council in Washington in 1975. His connections to the US were widely recognized at the time and condemned. Another fascist, Valerio Borghese, also called the Black Prince, was notorious for his ability to detect communists during the fascist Italian Social Republic. At the end of World War II, Borghese was rescued by the US Office of Strategic Services, a precursor to the CIA. An OSS officer who had been a close friend of the Borghese family managed to stop communist partisans who had captured Borghese and were about to hang him. He was sentenced to prison for 12 years, but his sentence was reduced to two years due to his, quote, glorious expeditions during the war in his defense against Yugoslav partisans. Borghese would be heavily involved with the MSI in the following years. Together with the Mafia and intelligence service leaders, he would plan a coup in 1970. Countless of fascist judges were spared and reintegrated into the supposedly anti-fascist government. And while the constitution was changed, the penal code of the fascist regime still remains to this day. Many Italians shifted the blame to the Nazis, saying that fascism in Italy was not as bad as Nazism or that Italy itself was a victim of the Nazis. While the Shelba Law of 1952 clarifies that the reorganization of a fascist party occurs when a group promotes a violent racist agenda, the government doesn't seem to be in a rush to ban open fascist organizations today. Today's fascists are compelled to moderate their presentation and hide their intentions. But it is really incredible how little they have to change their public face in order for the authorities to leave them alone. Another reason to hide and adapt their views was the pressure to adapt to the post-fascist Italian political climate. There were by and large two political currents within the MSI, a moderate line who sought to compromise with the bourgeois democratic system, and a radical line which founded the infamous Ordine Nuovo, New Order in 1956. Under the leadership of Pino Rauti, the Ordine Nuovo adapted their ideology to the new era, taking in elements inspired by reactionary Italian philosopher Julius Evola. An obvious violent fascist organization for everyone, it did not get banned by the state until 1973. 
In the meantime, in the so-called Years of Lead, Ordine Nuovo members carried out a bombing in Piazza Fontana in Milano that killed 17 people in 1969, attacked a train from Rome to Messina that killed six in 1970, and in 1972, one of their members, Vincenzo Vinciguera, killed three carabinieri through a car bomb near the village of Peteano. In 1974, eight participants in an anti-fascist demonstration in Brescia were killed by an attack with hand grenades. And on August 2, 1980, members of an Ordine Nuovo spin-off carried out the Bologna attack, killing 85 people and injuring over 200. The authorities attributed the attacks to, quote, left-wing extremist terrorists, mainly the Brigate Rosse, Red Brigades. But it was not until the 1990s where the real perpetrators were convicted. To this day, the Italian state does not recognize some victims of the terrorist attacks or their aftermath. A prominent example is anarchist Giuseppe Pinelli, who had been accused of being complicit in the Piazza Fontana attack. He was called for interrogation by the police before mysteriously falling from the fourth floor. Of course, this is still considered an accident, despite all the evidence pointing to murder. The Italian state never seriously engaged with the years of lead, with the complicity of its secret services, police and other state structures. And this doesn't even begin to grasp all the shady stuff going on behind these attacks. Several parliamentary investigations revealed the secret society Propaganda Due, short P2, also referred to as the shadow government of Italy. It was one of the driving forces behind these attacks, including falsifying evidence to attribute the attacks to left-wing groups. P2 members, among them the head of the secret service, Pietro Musumeci, were condemned for trying to mislead the investigation of the Bologna massacre. A list containing thousand names was published by the Parliamentary Commission, but total membership is estimated at 2,500. The list includes a who's who of the Italian establishment, including 70 wealthy industrialists, 52 high-ranking officers of the Carabinieri, 50 high-ranking army officers, 38 members of parliament, 37 leaders of the finance police, 10 presidents of banks and various other leaders of politics and business. In 1981, investigations revealed that the former Masonic Lodge had become a conspiratorial anti-communist network led mainly by Licio Gelli, a fascist who had been a volunteer for the black shirts and served as a liaison officer between Mussolini's government and Nazi Germany. In an interview with the Corriere, Jelly was asked how he would answer the question, what do you want to be when you grow up? And he replied, quote, a puppet master. He would say in 2008, quote, we had Italy in the palm of our hands. The rise of communism in Italy greatly worried the Freemasons. Prominent members of P2 included Silvio Berlusconi and several of his later ministers, Vittorio Emanuele of Savoy, last crown prince of the Italian kingdom, the aforementioned intelligence leader and fascist Vito Micelli, or banker of God, Roberto Calvi. The P2 network was revealed through the investigations into the collapse of Michele Sindona's financial empire. Michele Sindona was a powerful banker linked to the Sicilian mafia, the Cosa Nostra. Sindona and Roberto Calvi, both members of the Propaganda Due, had laundered illegal drug money from the mafia in the 1970s through a complicated system via the Institute of Religious Works, commonly known as the Vatican Bank. Several high-ranking members of Cosa Nostra had joined the Sicilian Masonic Lodges at their request in the course of that time. The Vatican lost an estimated $30 million due to the collapse of the Franklin National Bank owned by Michele Sindona. Sindona would die in prison after drinking coffee laced with cyanide. Roberto Calvi was found hanged in the city of London on June 18, 1982. 
Though new forensic methods in the late 90s increasingly indicated that Calvi had been murdered, their deaths would ignite further speculation on what the hell was going on in the shadows of Italian society. The P2 had also a big influence on the media. It took control of the Corriere della Sera, a big Italian newspaper in 1977. Money for the takeover was provided through funds from the Vatican Bank. The then editor was fired and the paper's editorial line moved significantly to the right. Later judicial investigations confirmed that P2 was involved with the false flag terrorist attacks staged in the 1970s. P2 was officially banned in 1982, however, some of those structures survived to this day. But more on that later. A Gladio researcher asked Jelly in 1991, quote, How far would you have gone in your campaign against communism? Jelly replied, quote, Ah, number one enemy was communism. We wanted to stop communism in its track. Eliminate communism. Fight communism. Francesco Cosiga, prominent politician of the liberal Christian Democrats, acknowledged in 1993 that Propaganda Due was an, quote, American import and, quote, the answer to the fears of Atlanticist circles, unquote, about a possible alliance between the dominant Christian Democrat Party, the Socialist Party, and the Communist Party. The fascist propaganda due leader, Licio Gelli, had excellent relations with the United States. He was invited in 1974 to the presidential inauguration ceremonies of Gerald Ford, in 1977 of President Carter, and in 1981 when Ronald Reagan became president. Gelli was proud to sit in the first row. At the end of World War II, Jelly managed to escape the communist partisans who were planning to execute him by joining the U.S. Army Counterintelligence Corps in 1944. Many people have testified to the existence of links between the U.S. and Jelly. Numerous documents imply links with the CIA. One note of an Italian journalist reads, quote, P2 is the lodge which maintains contacts with the CIA under the cover of international relations. Just like Michelli, Italian agent and Propaganda Due member Federico Umberto D'Amato worked for NATO security, heading the Interior Ministry Secretariat of the Atlantic Pact Security Office. In 1982, more documents were found hidden in the false bottom of a suitcase of Jelly's daughter at an airport in Rome. They were titled Memorandum on the Italian Situation and Plan of Democratic Rebirth and are seen as the political program of the P2. In them it says that the main enemies of Italy were the Italian Communist Party and the trade unions, particularly the Communist Italian General Confederation of Labor, the CGIL. These must be isolated from the Communist Party, which was the second biggest party in Italy at the time. Later in his life, Gelli stated that Silvio Berlusconi is still implementing the goals of the manifesto. The P2 was eventually banned and Licio Gelli served a 12-year sentence at home in his villa in Tuscany, where he died at age 96. Although the Communist Party of Italy had abandoned revolutionary positions and became reformist, the US and the Italian fascists still considered it a great danger. The Communist Party became the second largest party of Italy after World War II, attracting over 2 million members by 1947. It became the largest Communist Party in the West, reaching over a third of the vote share in the 70s. Despite the Communist Party's strength and commitment to liberal democracy, they were never allowed into the government. The whole Italian bourgeois society was ripe with anti-communism. The Vatican openly supported the Christian Democrat Party, saying it would be a mortal sin for a Catholic to vote for the Communist Party. Fascism is often thought of as a movement to subvert the status quo. However, it is also a movement of counter-subversion, that is, supporting the bourgeois state in its efforts to crush movements of the left. The MSI also supported the Christian Democrats in the 40s and 50s in anti-communist tactics. As did the CIA, giving significant funding to centrist parties in the late 40s. 
The CIA has also been accused of publishing forged letters in order to destroy the reputation of Italian Communist Party members. It is estimated that the CIA gave 10 to 20 million dollars to the government in order to undermine the Communist Party, not counting the millions affiliated with the Marshall Plan that went into anti-communist activities. The money was key in winning the elections in the late 40s against the communist socialist coalition that had worried the US. The US had a huge influence on weakened Italy after the war through the Marshall Plan and so on. Italy had a central position in the US strategy to stop the spread of communism. Located in the strategically important Mediterranean Sea and bordering Yugoslavia and Albania. This is well known and taught in any history class. What is rarely taught is how the CIA, which had just been founded in September of 1947, almost exactly 75 years ago, secretly collaborated with fascists and the mafia in Italy to crush the rapidly rising communist movement. Director of policy planning under Harry Truman and key person in the US State Department, George Cannon, recommended military intervention in Italy in case the Italian communists win the elections. Former President Cossiga admitted in the 90s after the Gladio revelations that during the elections in 1948, a paramilitary wing of the Democratic Christians, financed by party funds, would be among the first to take action in case of communist victory. Only when the communists were permanently excluded from the Italian government would they be allowed to join NATO in 1949. Three days before joining NATO, in close connection with the US, Italy created its secret service, CIFAR, which played a central role in the anti-communist network. The Italian secret service collaborated with US secret intelligence in the Demagnetize plan. The name expresses the intention of the plan to reduce the quote, magnetic attraction, unquote, that communist ideas exerted on the population of some countries, especially Italy and France, and demagnetization was the goal of absolute priority. Former members of the Nazi intelligence agency, the Sicherheitsdienst, took part in the so-called Los Angeles network, created by the CIA to spy on Italian communists. This was part of the so-called strategy of tension, a plan created by the army and intelligence leaders who embraced terrorist attacks as a tactic to undermine the communist movement in Italy, blaming those attacks on left organizations and associating workers and student activism as a danger to public order. Some members from the Nazi Sicherheitsdienst joined the Avanguardia Nazionale, National Vanguard, founded in 1959. Stemming from the Ordine Nuovo, it was also heavily involved in the strategy of tension. They too engaged in various attacks, including the assassination of an Italian state prosecutor using arms provided by the CIA through contacts in Francoist Spain. Its symbol was the Odal rune, an imitation of the insignia of an SS volunteer division. The rune was depicted on a red flag against a white background, which created a direct association with the swastika symbol of the Nazi party. Allies of the National Vanguard were the fascist Turkish Grey Wolves and the Greek far-right military junta. It was not until the 90s, many years later, when some light was shed into the bloodiest period of terrorism in Italy. Former Italian Prime Minister Giulio Andreotti, one of the most influential figures in Italian politics, revealed in 1990 the existence of Gladio, a clandestine stay-behind network all over Europe, co-organized by NATO and the CIA, with the official purpose of defending Europe against a potential Soviet Union invasion, though this had already been revealed by Vinci Guerra in his trial in 1984. Giulio Andreotti was a powerful figure in Italian politics, a capable and charismatic statesman. His political maneuvers were seminal in preventing the communists from getting any say in Italy. So him taking a key role in the revelation was a bombshell. The news made headlines all over Europe, 
The European Parliament expressed a protest in a strongly worded letter against NATO and foreign interference in European sovereignty. Communism was no longer a danger in the 90s. If the political establishment had revealed and made Gladio an important issue years earlier, it might have given the left a boost in popularity, corroborating the accusation that Italian state elements were in cahoots with the fascists. However, according to several inquiries, there was more behind this operation. A judge from the Italian Massacres Commission concluded that Ordine Nuovo and the National Vanguard were connected to the CIA, saying that the CIA encouraged them to commit the terrorist attacks. CIA officer Ray Klein confirmed in an interview, quote, It was not far-fetched that some far-right groups were recruited because, after all, they would be the only ones to warn us if there was a risk of a war against the communists in Italy. Gerardo D'Ambrosio, a judge summarizing the Gladio revelations, found the existence of instructions to infiltrate left-wing organizations and create social tension by blaming atrocities on communists. Another conspiracy revealed by Andreotti in the 90s was the Piano Solo. In 1964, the influential commander of the Carabinieri, Giovanni De Lorenzo, planned a coup in collaboration with Italian secret service CIFAR and the CIA. The plan envisaged the deployment of thousands of carabinieri and soldiers around the country and the detention of communist party cadres. It further conceived of a takeover of communist party and socialist party headquarters, including their affiliated newspaper L'Unità and Avanti. A report by the Parliament Commission in the year 2000 stated that the US followed the strategy of tension to, quote, stop the Communist Party of Italy, and to a certain degree also the Socialist Party of Italy, from reaching executive power in the country. Those massacres, those bombs, those military actions had been organized or promoted or supported by men inside Italian state institutions and, as has been discovered more recently, by men linked to the structures of United States intelligence. The report asserted that U.S. intelligence agents knew about the bombings beforehand, such as the 1969 attack in Milan, but refused to warn the Italian police. It also stated that the founder of Ordine Nuovo, Pino Rauti, regularly received money from someone in the U.S. embassy in Rome. Already before the end of the war, the U.S. government struck a secret deal with one of the biggest mafia bosses, Charles Lucky Luciano, who had been sentenced to 30 to 50 years in prison. In exchange for getting out of jail, Luciano would promise complete assistance through providing intelligence to the US on other mafia structures or through subverting workers' strikes. After the war, that clandestine collaboration would remain intact, as the mafia was useful in fighting communism. CIA secret agent at the time, Victor Marchetti, said, quote, The mafia, by its anti-communist nature, is one of the elements on which the CIA relies to keep Italy under control. The mafia's support would later be sought in the Golpe Borghese, a failed coup attempt of 1970. It was named after the aforementioned fascist Valerio Borghese. A direct connection between the Borghese coup and the activity of the Gladio network has been suggested. The secret operation was codenamed Operation Tora Tora after the attack on Pearl Harbor. The final phase of the coup envisaged the involvement of US and NATO warships which were placed on alert in the Mediterranean Sea. After the big left-wing protests in Italy, especially following the Piazza Fontana bombing, the right wing worried about the rise in strength of the communists. Giuseppe Saragat of the Socialist Party had become president in 1964, and the plan included his kidnapping and the occupation of Sesto San Giovanni, a commune in Milano, which was a stronghold of the communists. Hundreds of members of the fascist national vanguard were involved. According to various state witnesses, Borghese had asked the Sicilian mafia to support the coup. Among them was Tommaso Buscetta, who would break the fearsome code of silence known as Omerta. 
The plan could have replicated the CIA-assisted fascist coups that had taken place in Chile in 1973 or in Greece in 1967, but it was mysteriously aborted. One possible explanation was that it was NATO itself that stopped the coup. Wealthy businessman Remo Orlandini testified and insisted, quote, that's why I tell you that you don't have the slightest idea of the scale and the seriousness of the thing. The Mafia in Italy was well connected with the political and business establishment, and, well, dare I say, it still is. Stefano Bontate was a powerful member of the Sicilian Mafia and had links with the most powerful politicians, including Giulio Andreotti. He was assassinated by a rival grouping within the Cosa Nostra, the Corleonesi, in 1981. This would initiate one of the most brutal mafia wars in history with hundreds of mafiosi dead. Alright, let's turn that up. Let's turn that up. Let me hear a one-two from you, Pat. One-two. All right, there we go. Audio's good. Uh, if you want to hear the conclusion of this Best D Marks video, you're just going to have to, I don't know. Maybe wait a couple hours because we might just fucking watch <laughs> the rest of it because there's certain aspects of this that aren't covered in the book and thus they aren't covered in the slides. So a lot of the more, yeah, you have to, yep, there you go. Okay. Um, so a lot of the more uh, interesting turns of this situation, including the Vatican and Masonic temples and things like that, um, are covered a little bit more on, in that video than they are in, in this presentation because that's not mentioned much in the book for some reason. I think this book, well, I don't even know. Let me tell you guys something. This whole Gladio rabbit hole is something that <laughs> I, um, this is my week of finals. So I'm extremely busy. I had an extremely busy day today at work that I was working pretty much up until 5 p.m. when I normally have a little bit of extra time to like, you know, work on some recreational stuff since I'm sitting at my desk anyway. Today was hell. I took a final yesterday. Um, I would have liked to put a little more work into this than I did just because Gladio is such a fucking immense topic with Dude, it's we, like we could literally make an entire stream unto itself about gladio like right. forget like just this book or like any other period of history or anything else that we do we could literally start a whole new stream and stream for probably years talking about just gladio if we really wanted to so like i'm really not that worried i think you're being a little hard on yourself that's just my uh, i got a 95 on my computer science final yesterday or whatever it is um and then i have another final on sunday and i have a like a final report due by sunday also so that's what i'm all i'm all tangled up in that right now while also trying to do this also i have to read a bunch before our stream on friday i am really um you know burning everything at every end and i haven't even been to jiu-jitsu in two weeks and yes ross i am coping thank you <laughs> thank thank you ross for for keeping us so positive <laughs> <laughs> so uh yeah yeah it's it's gonna be it's gonna be a day it might even be a, a short one but like you know I, I really doubt it's gonna be that short you know what i mean oh also hey everybody uh if you're you know if you notice at the bottom right of your screen there is a donate to charity button uh we are currently running a fundraiser for books through bars philadelphia it is a nonprofit volunteer organization that helps get books into the hands of incarcerated individuals that would otherwise not have the ability to get them. Um, it can be an extremely difficult and trying process to get this type of literature into um, prisons and jails. We have a lot of fun here reading books and talking about books. So if you have a lot of fun with uh, reading, you know, help somebody who otherwise wouldn't be able to. If you can throw a dollar or whatever you can into the into the charity, that would be awesome. Um, I will be there tomorrow in person uh, volunteering myself. I have been doing on-site volunteering with the organization also. And I can tell you that this would definitely go to a very, very good cause. And uh, we never received the money. The money does not go to our pockets whatsoever. It's completely bypassed into the charity. So, or fundraiser, whatever you want to call it. Yes. Yeah, they accept the books. So they'll always take book donations as well. Yeah. So, uh, you know, I'm sure if you just uh, do a little bit of Google Foo and uh, find... Marks for Beginners, uh, I found there. What? The Marks for Beginners, yeah. That's fucking awesome. And also, I, 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 I there was a William Blum Bloom book there, Rogue State, who yeah. I sent to somebody. <laughs> 
who's asking for uh, history uh, and, and answers to history. <laughs> oh, thank you so much for the five dollar donation, Jen Kai Horiguchi's barber. <laughs> I shouldn't read those so fast. I, I I know that name, so I know that they're cool. But right. uh, you know, sometimes people, sometimes somebody will just add five dollars to that just to maybe make me say a very very naughty, <laughs> failed in a very unassuming way. I'm not gonna <laughs> lie, we're both kind of just like you know got so much shit on the screen that like when we're reading stuff like that, it's just like I'm not even thinking about it. Yeah. All right, so. You're probably wondering, uh, who are we? What is this? What am I watching? We are Subversive History. We're a multimedia community project seeking to bring attention to the revolutionary struggles of the world's often unsung and frequently misunderstood sectors. These are the stories of the demonized, vilified, whitewashed, or otherwise forgotten campaigns against imperialism, capitalist exploitation, racial apartheid. The orthodoxy of Western hegemony has often labeled these dissidents as subversive, and these are the struggles that we aim to illuminate. Yeah, on Elected Airwaves, I'm sure if you just go onto their website, there's uh, some way that you can do that, because we get tons of books that are just donated or dropped off or whatever. Yeah. I mean, you might have to like get however many pounds of books it is to a place in Philadelphia, but I'm sure if you're uh, willing to, uh, go right ahead. Hey, Grom, if you want to teach me how to do all that, I'm more than willing to learn. Yeah, um, yeah. And as far as, like, you know, if it's like you're, you're like, oh, I, I want to make sure that, like, you know, people get, like, I guess, like, subversive books, then, yeah, uh, they just just keep sending them. Just, just keep sending, you know, your subversive literature to Books Through Bars, and I'm sure it'll just be flooded with a bunch of, like, books about the CIA and Gladio. <laughs> it's like, sorry, we don't have any... Uh, mommy dommy erotica but we do have this book about like this coup in guatemala <laughs> done by the cia they are they are like something like like they did like tell us during orientation like that we can't be like yeah we can't take certain liberties like like if somebody asks for a, a quran don't send them a bible because yeah. it's like yeah this is a you know what i mean like that's fucked up <laughs> yeah <laughs> exactly like you know what I mean? just uh, thank you oh, anxious uh, mika anxious mika. mika thank you so much but yeah, like, you know what I mean? Like, so when I sent that William Bloom book, I was real strategic. Like, even though it was in my mind, it was the one rogue state. It's actually the specific one that Osama bin Laden recommends. Yeah. Um, so not this one? Not this one. Oh, so we've Osama been... bin Laden recommended William Bloom's rogue state. So we've been we've been telling chat lies this whole time that this book is... I've been saying that the author is recommended. Ah, Maybe the author. Lied. Maybe I've probably been lying. Yeah. No, I've probably been lying because yeah. you know one of us always tells the truth and the other lies, and it's up to chat to figure yeah. out who. <laughs> Mister Mister Bin Laden did say that everyone should read The Rogue State by William Bloom, and then he opens up his book with a Michael Parenti quote. While you know, and you know, and then he also has a Chomsky quote on front, so he's just appealing to everybody. You yeah. know what I mean? Like yeah. he's got a little something for everybody. He's casting a wide net. <laughs> he's. <ca> <laughs> Did Bin Laden ever write any books? I don't fucking know, man. <laughs> what about books about Gladio, but not in English? I'm sorry, I would not know about that. If I don't, I mean, I, you might be able to find translate. I'm sorry, I have no idea about not English books. I mean, like, I am a, I'm a intellectually destitute monolingual ape. I'm sure that there are people in american prisons that speak spanish <laughs> i'm not doubting that uh but as far as like you know how books through bars handles that i'm not really certain sorry oh. sweet swedish is not a common language here <laughs> we don't recognize swedish <laughs> yeah you see fart party 69 gets it english only <laughs> <laughs> all right so, also, good to see you in chat, Fart Party. Welcome, Sabotage Sword. Yeah, uh, Nuri Bessie, uh, French speaking about Gladio in Belgium. Yeah, there's actually something I have at the very end of this about the 1982, it's called like the Barrett shootings or killers, Barrett or Barbant. And um, it was French speaking, a uh, French speaking situation in Belgium. Uh, it's weird that you're referring to exactly that, but yeah. 
has a new bookshelf always with the questions um yes. uh, <laughs> powerful swinger uh, is there any good book on socialism yeah i actually have one here um i don't own this book yet but it's in my my old little cardi cart john if you want to bring this up yeah yeah, um, yeah send it to me i haven't read this but just based on what you're asking for um this seems like something that you may be interested in what the hell is going on uh also has a new bookshelf uh like every great uh marxist or leftist in general their kids are always uh a little bit short a little a little bit of a you know an l on that one um you know i think he's all right i don't think he's like you know anywhere near like the kind of uh I don't want to say like academic stature as his father. Uh, I think I know what you're getting at in terms of that article that he recently wrote. Uh, and uh, I didn't really read it because I don't know. It's Christian Perenity. It's it's not Michael Perenity. You know what I mean? We're not. Johnny, if you want to bring not, this up. Yeah. Did you send uh, it to me? Yeah. I just. Oh, there we go. Out. You know, we're not monarchists, you know, just because yeah, uh, he's uh, killing. That's what it is. Just because he's we, uh, Michael's kid, you know, doesn't always mean that, like... What are we, talk, what are we talking about? Uh, nothing. Has a new bookshelf. Just said, hi, I just read a local ML streamer saying Christian Perenni is great. What do you think? I haven't really read him. Anymore. Yeah. So, honestly, I haven't even read the article, and I haven't really read any of his works before, but, uh, you know. So, um, at the beginning of 2007... So, this is... Because the Marxist-Leninist uh, portion... Um, the Marxist-Leninist portion of uh, Yemen was South Yemen. And there's a lot of really interesting things about South Yemen. Um, if you just go on the South Yemen Wikipedia page, it's some really interesting uh, stats about the, the socialist project. Um, see right here. Um, if you want to bring this up, Johnny, so we can read it together. I, I hate reading it when not, they, uh, other people can't see it. Yeah, yeah, but yeah. I don't know. They brought up... Um, they brought up... Um, which... South Yemen, and it's something I'm so interested in. That, that and, and I agree with them exactly. That it's like it's one of those things that you're like, I didn't even know that there was a Marxist-Leninist state in South Yemen. So if you go down, there's a, there's a whole tab for just specifically the Marxist-Leninist state part. Okay, all right. Um, Trying that's to gonna explain everything that we want. There you go, right there. Up, oh, you went too oh, far. Oh, sorry, you sorry, sorry. Go up. Right here. Up. up Wait, no. Up. 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 There you go. Down. Just a bit of a lag. Bro. It's literally, it says establishment as a Marxist London state. It's the big, okay. there you go, right there. Right. Right there. Yeah. Um, June 1969, a radical Marxist swing of the NLF gained power, an event known as the Corrective Move. The radical wing reorganized the country into the People's Democratic Republic of Yemen. Subsequently, all political parties were amalgamated into the National Liberation Front, renamed the Yemeni Socialist Party, which became the only legal party. The People's Repu Democratic Republic of Yemen established close ties with the Soviet Union, People's Republic of China, Cuba, and the Palestinian and the PLO. East Germany's constitution of 1968 was even served as a kind of blueprint for the PDRY's first constitution. The new government embarked on a program of nationalization, introduced central planning, put limits on housing ownership and rent, and implemented land reforms. By 1973, the GDP of South Yemen increased by 25% crazy and despite the conservative environment resistance women became legally equal to men polygamy child marriage and arranged marriage were all banned by law equal rights and divorce were also sanctioned the republic also secularized education and Sharia law was replaced by a state legal code the, the major communist powers assisted in the building of the pdry's armed forces strong support from moscow resulted in soviet naval forces gaining access to naval facilities in south yemen the most significant among them a soviet naval and air base on the island of socotra for operations in the indian ocean so um, tons of like really interesting stuff about this. If you want to pull that book back up, this is the only book that I found that seems like it's somewhat covered this. Um, at the beginning of 2007, the Southern movement in South Yemen was a merger. So it doesn't necessarily cover that exactly because this is far after the establishment of that, which I think it said happened in 1969. But I think that like this independence movement of South Yemen has been persisting, I guess, up until now into the 2007. And I think probably directly, you know, the fingerprints of that Marxist Leninist state is probably directly all over the current Yemen conflict, I would assume. Right. I haven't read I, I haven't read enough or or even like you know investigated it enough to make a comment about that. But yeah, I would check this out. Go up again. What's it called? 
It is called South Yemen's Independent Struggle, Generations of Resistance. Yeah, I would I would check that out if, um, you know, just asking for a quick, this is the one that's in my cart. It's one of the only things that I really found that seemed interesting on that topic. I have a book downstairs too, but I don't want to run downstairs to get it um, at the moment. <laughs> What's some Marxist Leninist fingerprints all over me? I know that in the current conflict in Yemen, the South want to succeed, succeed again. They mm. were fighting the Saudis, the Houthis and the state. Yeah. Again, uh, I haven't done enough, you know, uh, research yeah, to really make a comment. All right. I mean, like, uh, it has a new bookshelf. I'm not even going to touch that. I, I don't, I've never heard of the guy. I don't really care. Uh, you know, I don't really take much stock of anybody that unironically calls themselves a, a Stalinist. So I don't, I don't, again, I don't really care. Uh, Houthi seem pretty cool. I mean, like, uh, look, I don't know. I don't know enough about it to, to really, uh, go one way or the other about it. I know that, uh, predominantly it's been Afro Yemenis that have been, uh, suffering like the hardest in the last, uh, you know, couple of years against the Saudis. This is another book I have. This isn't about like the ML state specifically, but The Last Refuge, uh, Yemen, Al-Qaeda, and America's War in Arabia. Uh, it says, spanning nearly three decades from the anti-Soviet jihad in Afghanistan to September 11th and beyond, The Last Refuge details the Al-Qaeda's rise, fall, and ultimate resurrection in Yemen. Um, drawing on the organization's Arabic, ba Arabic battle notes, Greg Johnson brings us inside Al-Qaeda's training camps and safe houses onto the front lines of an intense conflict marked by suicide bombers, autonomous drones, uncertain borders, and underground networks. With a new chapter that brings the story up to date, Last Refuge unflinchingly portrays America's attempt to fight a new type of war in one of the most turbulent... Oh, I don't know. I just had this on my bookshelf. I'm not really... This doesn't really cover that. There you go. Has a new bookshelf. I think uh, Unelectable Airwaves answered you know, that whatever article written by whoever, uh, perfectly. All right. Where are we at? Closing that, closing that. You ready? Is Christian Peretti a pat sock? I don't think he's a pat sock. I think he wrote a dumb article. Fair enough. Okay, yeah, I'm ready. Oh, we're opening with, uh, come on, let's hear that mid-Atlantic accent. Batavia has been the center of the Indonesian nationalist movement. Damn. And a pretty thorough and up-to-date oh, nope. organization it, it seems to be. The word Indonesia implies the inclusion of nearly all the East Indian islands. The leader of the movement, which, as I've said, is centered in Java, is Dr. Sukarno. He is seen here presiding over a meeting of what he calls the Cabinet of the Indonesian Republic's government. He describes himself as president. Describes himself as president. Past meetings at many places in Java and Sumatra called upon the people to present a united front to the Dutch and their allies. And the claim has insistently been made that Indonesia has already established itself as a self-governing state. Some of these pictures were taken by allied cameramen. Others are extracts from an Indonesian newsreel. In each so case, it's there. perfectly obvious that the nationalists mean... What's that? He was so young there. Yeah. Indonesia for Indonesians. We don't want to be ruled by the Dutch or any foreign nation. I don't know. They're saying it in uh, pretty legible English, what they want. Yeah. <laughs> Business. British troops have had to take a hand in dealing with the situation in Java, but as Mr. Attlee has said, we do not desire to be unnecessarily involved in the political affairs of non-British territories and our object is to withdraw British troops as soon as circumstances permit. 
I think, like, the only way they could have made it clearer if they had just a giant sign of, like, we have been colonized by Europe for, like, the last two centuries. We no longer want to be... We all hope that will be soon. And let's hope agreement will be reached between the Javanese and the Dutch. As long ago as December 1942, the Queen of Holland promised a large degree of self-government to Dutch oh, overseas yeah, possessions. Right. Dr. Sokano, however, demands complete independence for about 70 million people now. It speaks British news for itself. That's that's how it's supposed to be read, right? Yeah. It speaks British news. Oh, and uh, just for the record, that whole thing with the Dutch. Yeah. That, that whole like stop colonizing us. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that whole if you would just if you would just stop colonizing us, please. Oh Jesus fucking Christ. Yeah. That's, 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 that's a, again, I don't know how many times I need to say this on this stream. That's a <laughs> wide margin of error. That's <laughs> like super wide. And that's in 1949. We're not even talking like, oh, in like 1860 something. Well, who knows who, yeah. how many may have died. Yeah. We didn't even have calculators <laughs> yeah. back then. Let me get my abacus out to count the dead. <laughs> Oh, this? there's a little bit. There's some more. South Suwelsi campaign. Two months, one week, and four days. Unknown. Oh, no, I'm sorry. Between 3,100 and 3,500 civilians killed by the Dutch troops, with some like, summarily it's... executed, and approximately 1,500 killed by TRI troops. Yeah, and I love how... Um... I love how the Dutch, like, they don't, like, the, 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 the reputation of the Dutch doesn't suggest this. Like, that in 1949, that they were just, like, ruthless executioners of, like, any 15, any, any, um, any Indonesian villager over the age of 15. I read a little bit of those articles, and that was the thing. They would just line up anybody over the age of 15 and just wipe them out, um, in villages. That was the, uh, it's funny that, like, the Dutch have this, like, you know, there's so many of these countries, like, France is one that they get it enough though. They get it enough. People know about France, and then but then do they, they like, though? <laughs> they well, not enough. Yeah, but um, you know, America and and England get it like a lot. Like people know about that, and then France just stands just off to the side, yeah. and then all the way in a dark corner is like Dutch. Oh no, Spain gets it a lot too, and then Dutch is just like what? I don't know how to do a Dutch accent. I'm not gonna do it. Yeah, I don't even know. Um, I think it's just all what Hinga Dinga Durgan, right? That's 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 their thing, like Lee Erikson Day bullshit. Probably. I don't fucking I know. Think that might be, I think that might be Norway. <laughs> bring, yes, bring. Norway pancake. I was thinking of fucking gold member. <laughs> 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 don't forget the Portuguese. That's right, sabotage Never sword. Portuguese. Never forget the atrocities committed Portuguese by the Portuguese. Yeah, Never. In Africa. Yes. And in and in what is today Brazil. Yes, that's true. All right, so, so do you want to go first? Yes. So now we get into the book. We've got a little bit of background information. I think it's time we held Sakarno's feet to the fire. Also, I don't know if you know this. If you Google him, yeah. he has one name. He's like Cher. Get the fuck out of here. His Wikipedia page is just no, Sakarno. No, There's you're, no you're, you're lying. You're, he's <laughs> got to have fun. like a birth name or something. He does have a birth name if you go into it, but it's not even Sakarno. Wait, 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 no. Go up to the top, look. Sicarno. Come on. That's him. Come on. <laughs> where, where, where's the, the start of this shit? Wait, wait, he's got a whole... How long is this entry on the name? Oh, the Mahabharata. His father being Indonesian is influenced by Indian culture and Hindu mythology. Sue refers to Sanskrit, blah, 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 Sicarno, based on Dutch orthography. Mainly because he signed his name in the old spelling. Sicarno himself used a U in writing and not an O-E. Dutch style. All right, there's a lot going on here. What's his actual name? What did his oh, parents... Go to the top. Go to the very top. Stop. Born 
Cosno Sora de Harjo. I feel like it would be Coesno. Coesno. I, maybe. I, I don't know. I don't know how to speak fucking Javanese. Uh, Japanese? Oh, ja- Java, oh Javanese. 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 Like, <laughs> no, no, come on. Give me more credit than that. <laughs> yeah, so interesting uh, interesting character we have here in Sakarno. Yeah. Um, Another one of those lukewarm figures that are very present in the non-aligned movement that are like overall based, but like, you know, uh, I don't think even Sukarno is necessarily a communist. And I know that this was also levied towards our Benz, which I disagreed with. I would probably take a firmer agreement with William Bloom on this distinction with Sukarno, more of just like a de- anti-colonial nationalist. Um, which still checks many of the based categories of uh, individuals in history. Yes, uh, because I have not finished, uh, you know, the uh, the book by Vincent Bevins, but uh, I do remember starting. I do remember him characterizing, like, you know, the Marxist-Leninists, right, of Indonesia as more of like what we have talked about before, in that like this proliferated idea that like Marx thought like. You need to have capitalism first, and then you can start, like, implementing socialism because, you know, this is probably a largely agrarian country to begin with. Yeah, absolutely. I don't even think you you finished this slide, though. Or wait, no, wait. Oh, oh no, I didn't. I'm sorry. Okay, so I think it's time we <laughs> held Sakarno's feet to the fire, said Frank Wisner who would later commit suicide, I would imagine, because of the guilt of all the many, many, many people he directly caused suffering and or death. Uh, The CIA's deputy director of plans, covert operations, one day in autumn 1956, Wisner, a.k.a. The Wiz, as he was known, uh, was speaking of a man who had led Indonesia since its struggle for independence from the Dutch following the war. A few months earlier, in May, Sukarno had made an impassioned speech before the U.S. Congress asking for more more understanding of the problems and needs of developing nations like his own. The ensuing American campaign to unseat the flamboyant leader of the fifth most populous nation in the world was to run the gamut from large-scale military maneuvers to seedy sexual intrigue. The previous year, Sukarno had organized the Bandung Conference as an answer to the Southeast Asia Treaty Organization, CETO. The U.S. created political military alliance of area states to contain communism. In the Indonesian city of Bandung, the doctrine of neutralism had been proclaimed as the faith of the underdeveloped world. To the men of the CIA station in Indonesia, the conference was heresy, so much so that their thoughts turned toward assassination as a means of sabotaging it. I mean, this makes what, like, there's Sukarno, uh, there's... Cuba, there's uh, 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 Vietnam, right? How how many different like you know revolutionary leaders of like you know kind of like socialist sort of trajectory or at least like kind of a bend yeah. to them yeah, at there's, first? There's a video coming on the Bandung conference, right? Um, that's going to show a lot more of it. If you want to pull that up, or I can send you this Wikipedia page that shows all of it. Yeah, just send it to me. But I'm just getting it that, like, you know, there's all of these different countries. It's much deeper than that. Like, there's a lot of countries that have nothing really to do with socialism that are just like, we are, like, of the global south. We're African and Asian nations, and we all need to have some kind of solidarity in, like, the post-World War II world. But almost all of them at some point say to the U.S., like, hey, we need help, right? And the U.S. is like, not only are we not going to help you, we're, we're going to overthrow your government go down if you just slide down there's a, there's a whole list of everyone that was involved at the bandung conference yep there you go yeah, i feel like we went over the ban- yeah there you go beautiful you're, we went you're... over bandung uh during the divide right yeah and also with malcolm x because he was extremely yes. um extremely hyped on this it's quite a uh list of nations yeah Burma, Cambodia, Ceylon, China, Cyprus, Egypt, Ethiopian, Gold Coast, Kingdom of Iraq, Japan, Hashemite Kingdom of Jordan, Kingdom of Laos, Lebanese Republic, Liberia, Kingdom of Libya. Wow. 
Oh, look, look who else is here. <laughs> oh, hey, bud. <laughs> Even this. Wow. Twenty twelve. Oh, this is the more recent yeah. ones. Cypress two. <laughs> or no, that would be the uh, Cypress Squared, right? Yeah. And then you said there was one other thing you wanted to send me? No, no, go ahead. It's I have the video on the, the slides. Oh, okay. There you go. There's my guy Nehru. Fifty-four percent of the world's population took part in this. That's a lot of the population. Pause it. Well, it's probably almost over, but there's there's Nasser. Yeah. Um, but this goes this this also goes to show like a lot of what J uh, Jason Hickel was speaking about in the divide, where like um, you know I forget how many people are like involved in like like obviously NATO is bigger now, but even like the like the relevant portion of like the United Nations and things like that, like the the the, the parts of the globe that have the most voting power, like the United States and France. France, <laughs> France, <laughs> combination of Britain and France. Britain and France yeah, France. Um, like how little of the population really like calls the shots for the entire globe. And like, you know what I mean? Like if you took Africa and China and um, India, plus, you know, obviously other parts of the global South, like you're accounting for like two thirds of the world that just has like very little say in like right. almost any of the planet's decisions. All right. But the North Atlantic uh, treaty organization somehow has like dictatorial rule over like, the entire rest of like you know the landmass of the world yeah also uh ross sent us a link of a short list of u.s coups plus music i don't know if it's up to you if you want to play it or not um why don't you just put it in a window we'll watch it at the end right. wanna, or or in between indonesia and europe if you want. sounds good to me <laughs> oh come on because i'll i'll go i'll go on tangents if no, you i know like. all right i don't want to yeah. be in the middle of the Good point. All right. There's Nasser. And anti racism. Oh, no. And anti militarization. What's up, boys? You gotta love these uh, these little alerts. Telesur is funded in whole or in part by multiple Latin American governments. Wow. Isn't it Venezuelan? I, I it says multiple, Pat. Yeah, but isn't Telesur a, a Venezuelan media company? Oh, fuck if I know, man. It says multiple multiple Latin American governments. That could be Brazil. I think no. Wait. Yeah, no, Brazil's Latin, right? So, like, that could be, like, any of them. Sponsored by the governments of Venezuela, <laughs> Bolivia, Cuba, and Nicaragua. For some reason, it's headquartered in Caracas. Ah. Plus, a lot of those sound very uh, not friendly to America. So, you know, we can't be trusting their their state propaganda, of course. <laughs> and actually, it's really funny because we this actually gets tackled later in the... In the um, in the uh west europe section where like the cia is making all these like magazines like these like non-stalinist left magazines and right. things like that and it's like 
these are private organizations <laughs> like that are like this is the free press the private the private press which is always yes. more ethical than a state-funded media outlet. of course yes if viacom yeah. owns your media it is <laughs> by definition better and more ethical and truthfulier right. than anything that's state funded who's more honest pat right the state or some guy that has more money than like the majority of people living within that state and the yeah. media that he you know wants to put out there exactly rupert murdoch <laughs> or uh you know evil morales like you know who's who do you want you know disseminating information who can to? i trust to be more honest all right i just don't know, I just don't know. <laughs> you know what i mean it's like a toss-up is the first intercontinental conference of colored peoples so-called colored peoples in the history of mankind I am proud that my country is your host. It is a new departure in the history of the world that leaders of Asian and African peoples can meet together in their own countries to discuss and deliberate upon matters of common concern. Success. In spite of diversity that exists among its participants, let this conference be a great success. Yes, there is diversity among us. Who denies it? Small and great nations are represented here with people professing almost every Pretty religion much right. under the sun. Buddhism, Islam, Christianity, Confucianism, Hinduism, Jainism, Sikhism, Zoroastrianism, Shintoism, and others. Almost every political faith we encounter here, democracy, monarchism, theocracy, with innumerable variants, and practically every economic doctrine has its representative in this hall. Marhainism, socialism, capitalism, communism, in all their manifold variations and combinations. But, again, what harm is in diversity when there is unity in these sire? This conference is not to oppose each other, it is a conference of brotherhood. All right, just little little words from the man himself regarding the Bandung. Yeah, and like what I was getting at before when I said like, how many countries is it that like you know have have literally pled with like the the U.S. Right? Like I, I I'm not saying that socialist ones are the only ones. Right. You know, or like the only countries that like, you know, he was willing to to work with, especially uh, at the Bandung conference. But like, you know, it just adds another country to the list where it's just like, look, we're we're not with the Soviets. We're not like, you know, explicitly with China. They are observing. But that but doesn't just, mean we won't do business with right. anybody that's that's advantageous for us to be doing business. With. Exactly. Like, we're not going to we're not going to pretend that the Soviet Union is some kind of black hole on the map that we can't trade with or receive aid from. Right. But also, we're not like necessarily communists. Like, right. you know what I mean? Like, so like, leave us the fuck alone. We have a lot of work to do here because our we've been pillaged for the past 200 years by your piece of shit fucking s <laughs> small part of the fucking map. Like, your please. tiny, shitty, rainy, fucking, like, loud, annoying part of the world, right? Just let us be. But no, um, that's not what's going to happen. visiting this, this interesting document again. If you were here for the Middle East section that we did a couple, like, like, like a week ago, um, we talked about a uh, Iraqi general that received a monogrammed handkerchief with a certain disabling or incapacitating agent in it. That comes from the same report. This talks about Lumumba. It talks about Castro. If anybody's <laughs> interested in reading about the alleged assassination plots involving foreign leaders, uh, it's really spelled out for you in this, uh, in this report. Um, if you want to read a bunch of those. 
Um, that I think they call it the health alteration committees. Yes, yes. Yeah, the health alteration committees. But this one refers specifically to Sicarno. Uh, in addition to the plots discussed in the body of this report, the committee received some evidence of CIA involvement in plans to assassinate President Sicarno of Indonesia and Papa Doc Duvalier Duval Duval of Haiti. Uh, Duvalier. Former deputy director for plans Richard Bissell testified that the assassination of Sicarno had been contemplated by the CIA, but that painting had planning had processed no further than identifying an asset whom it was believed might be recruited to kill Sicarno. Arms were supplied to dissident groups in Indonesia, but according to Bissell, those arms were not intended for assassination. No, no, just uh, other things, other things that guns are used for. To add to the concern of American leaders, oh wait, let me put this back on. I always forget to turn the music back on. To add to the concern of American leaders, Sukarno had made trips to the Soviet Union and China, though to the White House as well. He had purchased arms from Eastern European countries, but only after being turned down by the United States. He had nationalized many private holdings of the Dutch and perhaps most disturbing of all, the Indonesian Communist Party, PKI, had made impressive gains electorally and in union organizing, thus earning an important role in the coalition government. It was a familiar third world scenario, and the reaction of Washington policymakers was equally familiar. Once again, they were unable or unwilling to distinguish nationalism from pro-communism, neutralism from wickedness. By any definition of the word, Sukarno was no communist. He was an Indonesian nationalist and a Sukarnoist who had crushed the PKI forces in 1948 after the independent struggle had been won. He ran what was largely his own show by granting concessions to both the PKI and the army, balancing once again one against the other. As to the excluding the PKI, with its more than one million members from the government, Sukarno declared, I can't and won't ride a three-legged horse. So, it, I, I think what they're trying to say is that, like, they weren't necessarily part of the government, but he wasn't going to, like, you know, deny them from having any say. There's, like, a million of them. They were, like, the largest mm -hmm. communist party in the world at that time. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Let's see what else we got. When the Communist Party did well again in the local elections held in July, the CIA viewed it as a great help to us in convincing Washington authorities how serious the Indonesian situation was. The only person who did not seem terribly alarmed at the PKI victories was Ambassador Allison. This is all. This was all we needed to convince John Foster Dulles finally that he had the wrong man in Indonesia. The wheels began to turn to remove his last stumbling block in the way of our operation. John Allison, wrote Smith, was not a great admirer of the CIA to begin with. And in early 1958, after less than a year in the post, he was replaced by Ambassador Howard Jones, whose selection pleased the CIA Indonesia staff. On November 30, 1957, several hand grenades were tossed at Sukarno while he was leaving a school. He escaped injury, but 10 people were killed and 48 children injured. The CIA in Indonesia had no idea who was responsible, but it quickly put out the story that the PKI was behind it at the suggestion of their Soviet contacts in order to make it appear that Sukarno's, op Sukarno's opponents were wild and desperate men. As it turned out, the culprits were a Muslim group not associated with the PKI or with the agency's military plotters. Um, so this is like kind of like the first like CIA situation where they didn't even were even behind the assassination attempt, but they just figured that they would fabricate a story surrounding it that they could proliferate to, uh, you know, influence the situation in a certain way um this this link is regarding the elections um from 1957 if you just scroll down you can see how the communist party did so there's um in jakarta they were a very close second to the islamic party um which may have been the ones that were potentially behind the throwing grenades at sukarno who knows right. um but yeah so and you can see here that even if you look at the percentages um that's actually a minus 4.1 percent decrease Huh. in uh the 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 islamic party but a 7.1 percent increase in the um communist party the pakai and that is appears to be one of the only positive trending political parties in indonesia at that time 
Um, and if you go down, this was only in Jakarta. If you go down to Java, the PKI is in first place by a pretty considerable margin. If you go to Yogi Karata, PKI is in first place by a significant margin. If you go to East Java, PKI is in second place by a very small small margin. And if you look again at the percentage change from 55, the um, the second largest party went down 3.7 percent, whereas the PKI went up 4.1 percent. Um, and if you look at the other numbers, like that's like almost like a very unprecedented rate of growth too. Even when you yeah. see the other ones, they're like up by like 0.2 percent and shit like that. Um, that wait, hold on, Can oh, you go back sorry, up. Sorry, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, sorry. West Java, you have again uh, the, the the Islamic Party coming out a little bit ahead, but also no, that one actually is very significantly ahead. But if you look, their increase is only 0.08 percent, whereas the PKI grew by 3.5 percent. Um, then you have South Sumatra, which um, again, Muslim Party went was huge here like landslide victory for the um islamic party but still a considerable increase in percentage of the pki so um it certainly isn't um <laughs> communism is surprisingly popular among the proletariat um, um but yes so there is um to say that the communist party was growing in popularity and was an extremely significant portion of the indonesia political sphere is is somewhat of an understatement it was probably like an essential portion of it which is probably why in the future you're gonna hear like potentially a million people dying to suppress that popularity yeah but also in interesting thing pat did you know that uh indonesia has one of the world's largest muslim populations i think it has the single largest yeah the single largest yeah i did know that well i didn't know <laughs> well, that well <laughs> Uh, this is a book that is uh, quoted pretty um, extensively throughout this um, yeah. that William Bloom uses. I just put a picture in it. He talks about being an Indian and organizing certain things in, you know, Indonesia, that place. The issue of Sakurno's uh, supposed hand-in-glove relationship with communists was pushed at every opportunity. The CIA decided to make capital reports that a good-looking blonde stewardess had been aboard Sukarno's aircraft everywhere he went during his trip in the Soviet Union, and that the same woman had come to Indonesia with Soviet President uh, Soviet President Clement Voroshilov and had been seen several times in the company of Sukarno. The idea was that Sukarno's well-known womanizing had trapped him in the spell of a Soviet female agent. He had succumbed, sounds like my life, um, he had succumbed to a Soviet control, CIA reports implied as a result of her influence or blackmail, or both. A little bit of this, calm A, a little bit of calm B. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this formed the foundation of our flights of fancy, wrote Smith. We had a matter of fact, considerable success with this theme. It appeared in the press around the world and when round table, the serious British quarterly of international affairs came to analyze the Indonesian revolt in its March 1958 issue. It listed Sukarno's being blackmailed by a Soviet female spy as one of the reasons that caused the uprising. So yeah, so... um. I think I don't think that it is a CIA fabrication that Sakarno was a bit of a playboy. Um, he was certainly engaging in the sexual activities, um, but they decided to take this uh, known womanizing of <laughs> Sakarno and make it into this larger issue of Soviet blackmail. This is, uh, I think, another case of um, the CIA not doing enough research on the people that they're trying to win the hearts and minds of yeah because i'm pretty sure this backfired and most people were like yeah. yo that's sick that's awesome good for him dog <laughs> I you know? say, when i was on his wikipedia page i think it did say something about it bolstering his popularity yeah. like, this, like chad he was like this chad anti-colonialist like hell yeah dog my well, dude's got our like guy. <laughs> our guy's got like a soviet studer's girlfriend hell yeah but uh the other thing is because i know our chat is filled full of uh dirty rotten evil tankies right chat what's your uh what's your opinion on president uh clement voroshilov i don't even know who that is oh come on uh, every good communist you know remembers the administration of uh president clement uh voroshilov right did he have an administration he's the soviet president is he not Is the president the same thing as a fucking? I'm I'm waiting, chat. What's what's your what's your opinion on President Clement Voroshilov? I'm just kidding. I, I have no fucking idea who 
I've never even heard that name before. Clement Vor- 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 Voroshilov? He died in 1969. It's funny. He started to feel unwell. His family proposed to call an ambulance immediately, but he adamantly refused. In the morning, he put on his military uniform, and after calling a car, he went to the hospital himself, fully decorated, and he d- then he died. Like a, like a Chad. With all his medals. Yeah. He was in World War II. What, what is your bad. opinion on RFK throwing his hat in the ring to topple by? <laughs> RFK? What do you mean, like, the dead brother of JFK? Is that happening right now? Do we have, like, a, a phantasm of RFK, like... Is Robert Kennedy's <laughs> last middle initial also F? Is he also a Fitzgerald? Is there another Kennedy? Oh, there's another fucking Kennedy? <laughs> <laughs> I had you know, no RFK fucking TV. idea. I don't give a you shit. Know, I did hear about this a little bit. When I, you know, and maybe Matt watched this too uh, on electable airwaves. But when I went deep into the, like the QAnon stuff, I think there is like a a a line or a strain of that that believes that like there is like Kennedy time traveling or like fake deaths of Kennedys that are like now assisting Trump in like expunging the deep state. Um, oh wait, no, you're talking about JFK Jr. Me? J- yeah, JFK Jr. How he's like come well, back from the dead, right, from the plane crash. <laughs> There's just some stuff about like Trump, Trump colluding with uh, uh, a potentially dead or potentially time traveling Kennedy. Dude, uh, have you seen the guy? They keep trying to say, "Oh, it's it's JFK Jr. He's back from the dead or something." Dude, all right, you know that like JFK Jr. was like six foot two or something. This guy that they're saying is JFK Jr. is like five seven, right? And looks absolutely nothing like him. I love it. I love every we, single second of can it. Can we put this on the docket for the end of stream? <laughs> yes. I really, I really want to investigate this and get a little deeper into it. But I just can't be conscious and do it at this moment. Yes. So please, can you just set a little docket and put the video that, that Ross sent so we don't forget about that? It's still and up then, there. I have it saved. And can you just add JFK Jr. question mark to that, yes. please? Yes. Thank you. Absolutely. <laughs> I can't fucking wait for that. I need uh, that today. Yeah, you're you're looking a little uh, a little frayed today. I'm I'm, yeah. I'm gonna make sure that we get through this. All right. Yep. So this is mine, right? Sure. Yeah. Seemingly, the success of this operation inspired CIA officers in Washington to carry the theme one step further. A substantial effort was made to come up with a pornographic film or at least some still photographs that could pass for Sicarno and his Russian girlfriend engaged in his favorite activity. I wonder what that could be. Maybe it's, I don't know, uh... Crochet? Yeah, crochet, you know, the, the, the scrapbooking, maybe. When the scrutiny of available porno films supplied by the chief of police of Los Angeles, who knew that uh, LAPD would be into such things, failed to turn up a couple who could pass for Sicarno, dark and bald, and a beautiful blonde Russian woman, the CIA undertook to produce its own films. Quote, the very films with which the Soviets were blackmailing Sicarno. The agency developed a full face mask of the Indonesian leader, which was to be sent to Los Angeles, where the police were to pay some porno film actor to wear it during his big scene. The pro- this project resulted in at least some photographs, although they apparently were never used. I also can't so. imagine how incredibly fucking disturbing they look watching some poor blonde girl get fucked by Leatherface. That's actually my kink. I can, only, <laughs> uh, I can actually only climax to Sicarno, <laughs> to the Sicarno uh, imitation uh, sex tapes. Um, I can, I can there's only. Actually, <laughs> there's actually an entire uh, section of Pornhub for this type of thing. Um, d- uh, uh, anti-colonial leaders, um, <laughs> sex <laughs> blackmail sex tapes. That's a. Uh, it's kind of my thing. I, you know, there's this one Patrice Lumumba video. I, 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 I yeah, I nothing, nothing, nothing works. Nothing else works for me anymore. I just, I can't come without it. But I just, um, also, I can't imagine like, you know, like the. Oh. 
Yeah. Also, this is in like nineteen the nineteen fifties. Like, how good was was were masks back then? Like, like I feel like in obviously you could just CGI it now. Like they're even doing right. this kind of deep fake shit. But I mean, like I imagine up in like the early two thousands, they're pretty good at like making masks. Like they did like white chicks and stuff like that. Like you no, can no, make no, no, like no. A, dude. This is look. When did when did uh when did Halloween come out? The J- like in 1990 or something like that? No, like no, 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 no. Like, yeah, like the first Halloween movie, right? Like, y- you realize that, like, Michael Myers is literally just wearing a mask of, of William Shatner, right? 1978. Holy shit. Right. 19, old, yeah, yeah. Yeah. 1978, right? Oh, this is William 19. Shatner. This is 1957, right? So that means it's like 10 times <laughs> worse than the William yeah. Shatner mask from Halloween. I just, I just really feel bad that, like, I just I just hate that they didn't actually make this and put it out so I could watch it because I I just would like also I, I like to think about like some like CIA director that's there <laughs> while it's happening like like that's just like in the room like directing it like as to how he think it should be for Sicardo. All right now uh, thrust harder. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I need d- you in a more communistic position. Yeah. Can you um more more da say da louder. Da. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> what's 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 rush what's rushing for harder? <laughs> Send the intern <laughs> to the, the library, I guess, because we don't have phones. I don't know. <laughs> Send him to the library. <laughs> I just I can't imagine how horrific this mask looked. <laughs> like, you know that's probably why they didn't go through with it. You know how right. they, like I said, <laughs> it only got to photos and then they just kinda gave up. You know they put the mask on some LA porn star and there's just a couple people sitting around taking pictures and they're looking at each other like, <laughs> like This isn't this, gonna work. This dude that like straight up looks like Leatherface from the Texas Chainsaw <laughs> Massacre. Yeah. And, yeah. Like... and you have him speaking this very poor Javanese. Like he's like speaking just like in a very, very, very unbelievable javanese accent like also it's los angeles how fucking yeah. hard could it possibly be to find a dark-skinned bald guy to be fair to be fair there is a skateboarder that looks a lot like sicarno and i don't know if this is me being racist right. god what's the name um this is pat's racist arc um god he skates for uh hold on is it tony hawk Yes, it's Tony Hawk. <laughs> um, hold on one second. Um, oh. <laughs> like, hey, uh, listen, uh, you can uh, you can make a copy of this for me, right? Yeah. <laughs> Are there hold any on. pictures of it that exist? I mean, if I would have been able to find them, I would have fucking, I would have like definitely fucking. Jeez, Safe I can't search is off. Are you searching for it? Yeah, do that yeah, while I try to yeah, find this. Yeah, no, I'm I'm definitely searching for this. No, there's no way that's it. That's just that's just a chubby Indonesian guy. Come on, nothing. Also, I'm amazed that like you know for uh, like the amount that like. Castro allegedly banked that there's no like there's no Castro you know porno out there yeah like out of all the blackmail that you would think would exist you would think there would at least be like you know uh... here okay so tell me if tell me if I'm racist or not for thinking that this looks like Sicarno alright yeah uh, I don't know if Wilco's here Wilco, please judge me on my racism for uh, thinking that this not Asian person <laughs> looks like uh, Sicarno. All right, so this is the guy. All right, now let's let's pull up what Wilco Sicarno here. actually looks like. Wait, before you do it, I want you to get in this boat with me. Do you think this looks like Sicarno? Uh, I don't know, dog. Uh, sorry. <laughs> I haven't stared at images of President Sicarno like nearly often enough to be like, oh yeah. I looked at him all day today, and I was like, damn, it looks like Daniel Castillo. Oh, all right, all right. Now that I found a picture of him like smiling next to JFK, 
It's like I can I can see it like a little. Look at the young one up there in the left. He's 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 a little bit more weathered there. Look at him up in the left. <laughs> What's I'm saying? All right, all right. This one, I, I was thinking at least yeah, this one where the mouse. The young is ones, the yeah. young ones in the in the in that video that I showed in the beginning. You know what? Go back to the video. We're just gonna do young President Sicarno, right? I wish there was like more pictures of him like smiling in public. That would make this yeah. like way easier. There's really not a whole lot. I don't know what the fuck that is. I think that's a wax <laughs> of him. Look but down I, there. Wait, go down. Where? Where's the, look, look at him yelling right there with his hand up. I feel like the, it's here we go. Here. How about this? All right, there's him smiling as, as much as much as I'm like there. It's it's not doing you any favors, I'm not going to lie. This is how, this person's face, Daniel Castillo, is when I think of Sicardo in my head, this is what I see. I know. And like I it, I'm not saying it's not there. All right. You know, it's uh it's questionable like look like even this picture of him right here this is the video that i sent earlier i feel like it looks like that guy i i still think you know like uh if we just had like a set of calibers or something we could start yeah, that would really that would really settle this debate yeah. once and for all we could really like get down to like you know is Pat being racist or no, not? No one is in Pat... chat is even giving me their opinion. No, no, no. no one. <sighs> chat is debating whether or not to even keep watching this shit at this point. <laughs> it's just like, I don't know how I feel about this. Go to the, this... Go to the video. I have a video that's All nice. right, all right, all right, all right. And, and we can let that marinate. No, the video's in the slides. Oh, okay. Just put on that video. In 1945, Sukarno became the first president of Indonesia. He rose to become the leading figure of a strategic region during the Cold War. Are they playing the Star Wars cantina music? It is thus that he became the target of one of the most bizarre counter-espionage plots, the CIA porn movie. The story was revealed by an ex-CIA agent, and it was also mentioned by Oliver Stone in The Untold History of the United States. During the 60s, the Kennedy administration tried to seduce Sicarno with the benefits of capitalism. But Sukarno was more interested in his communist neighbors. Aww. It was time to do something dramatic. A porn movie where Sukarno would play the leading role. The idea was to discredit the president, but failing to find a suitable porn actor that looked like Sukarno, they created a latex mask with his likeness. Hold on, can you just pause this real quick? I, I like how I'm the one who got canceled. When you're the one, you're like, you're in L.A., which Daniel Castillo is from L.A., by the way. Okay. You're in L.A., you can find a fucking Sicarno look like anywhere. 1950, look, first of all, the audience is going to be who? White people or, like, other people? Not to mention it's the CIA. They're already racist, okay? You can't tell me that they're not. <laughs> I'm just putting my mind in the mind of a racist CIA agent, okay? You can't cancel me for that. It could have been Daniel Castillo. If I was a racist CIA agent, which maybe I am, who knows? Who knows? You know, you know? You, you'll learn soon that the CIA is pretty crafty with, you know, uh, infiltrating. I find someone of Kristen Stewart, although I look nothing like her. Yeah, no, I, I'm sorry, V. I, I don't think you look anything like Kristen Stewart. <laughs> I don't even know who Kristen Stewart is. Isn't that like the, 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 the fucking Scientology lady from The Handmaid's Tale? I have no idea. I don't fucking know. They just hire an Italian. Yeah, exactly. This is like even before Sergio Leone is paying fucking Italian dudes to play Mexicans in his fucking westerns. Oh, Twilight. Twilight. No, it's the Twilight lady. Uh, no. 
No copy of the film survives, but it is said that the plan was a total failure. Rather than express surprise and outrage at the leader's apparent peccadilloes, Indonesians merely shrugged. Spying is not what you were led to believe it is. So yeah, uh, the population didn't really give a shit. No, they were just kind of like, eh, it's our guy! Yeah. Also, uh, speaking of Twilight, right, uh, I have watched the entire Twilight franchise. It is The first movie is the funniest shit I have ever seen, and the rest of the franchise is literally uh, just a live-action shown in anime. It's all about, like, you know, it, you could literally watch Bleach, right? Except just replace Shinigami with, like, vampires, and it's, like, the same shit. Pat has, like, no idea what the fuck I'm talking about right now. I haven't seen either. I haven't I watched anime or watched fucking I know. Any, of, any Twilight. I know. So, November 1957. I don't know what happened here. <laughs> 1957 19. The CIA's paramilitary machine was put into gear. In this undertaking, as in others, the agency enjoyed the advantage of the United States' far-flung military empire. Headquarters for the operation were established in neighboring Singapore, courtesy of the British. Training bases set up in the Philippines, airstrips laid out, Philippines airstrips laid out okay, in various parts of the Pacific to prepare for bomber and transport missions. Indonesians, along with Filipinos, Taiwanese, Americans, and other soldiers of fortune, were assembled in Okinawa and the Philippines, along with vast quantities of arms and equipment. For this, the CIA's most ambitious military operation to date, tens of thousands of rebels were armed, equipped, and trained by the U.S. Army. U.S. Navy submarines patrolling off the coast of Sumatra, the main island, put over-the-beach parties ashore along with supplies and communications equipment. The U.S. Air Force set up a considerable air transport force, which airdropped many thousands of weapons deep into Indonesian territory and a fleet of 15 B-26 bombers was made available for the conflict after being sanitized to ensure they were non-attributable and that all airborne equipment was deniable. So, this is a little bit more... Um, um, <laughs> um, this is a little bit more Sorry. into the, you know, the interesting, like... The international character of these kinds of situations because like you can look at just the internal issue in um indonesia where it's like a popularity contest or at least as it would seem between different political parties yeah. but then you have this force that wants to change the tide of this and they just so happen to be able to just set up in taiwan the philippines okinawa like they're just like oh great we have a vast military and intelligence apparatus that already completely surrounds your small country right well actually indonesia is a pretty big country but um you know what i'm saying yes that like you know they have many landing pads to leapfrog from in order to be able to manipulate things within this country that exactly. is actually like fairly important because again yeah. right this is the largest muslim population in the world right and what do a lot of people, right, uh, that are Muslim do? They go to Hajj, like Malcolm X, right? And that means that they are traveling abroad, and they're going to places, you know, like Saudi Arabia, for instance, you know? And uh, then those ideas of uh, communism and whatnot, well, that spreads like a wildfire. So... Here's a little bit of from the Wikipedia page on that specifically. Uh, the Indonesian government of Sukarno was faced with a major threat to its legitimacy beginning in 1956 when several regional commanders began to demand autonomy from Jakarta. After med mediation failed, Sukarno took action to remove the dissident commanders. In 58, elements of the Indonesian military, with the support of the CIA, rebelled against the rule of President Sukarno. This attempted coup ended in failure. In February 58, dissident military commanders in central Sumatra, Colonel Ahmad Hussein, and North Sulawesi, Colonel Ven Vente Samuel, declared the revolutionary government of the Republic of Indonesia Permesta movement aimed at overthrowing the Sakarta regime. They were joined by many civilian politicians from the Masayumi Party, which is, I believe, the Islamic Party, such as a name such as a name, that name who were opposed to growing to the growing influence of the communist party the uh, pki president Sukarno, in address to the un after the failed coup denounced imperialism and vowed he was determined to not let a small corner of the world to make demand determined to not let a small corner of the world 
to make a play thing of Indonesia. Right. I'm like trying to pronounce this in my head still, and it's just. It's you want to go? You want to take a crack at it? Not at all. Because <laughs> there's one part that you know I know I'm gonna mess up, and then Wilco's gonna clip it out of context. Oh, hell yeah, the the pass. First films of the civil war in Indonesia. Airborne forces of the central government are flown into Sumatra, the main island rebelling against the government of President Sukarno. In the ancient land that ten years ago won its independence from the Dutch, a modern touch. Paratroopers hit the silk. Their target, rich American operated oil fields seized by the rebels. Can you pause that? I love that like back then they didn't know that like maybe don't say that. It's, it's not a good look, you know, half a century later. <laughs> it's, it's like, wait, wait, what were they protecting? What were they going for? What was <laughs> oil the rich American oil fields. <laughs> rich American oil fields. <laughs> At the same time, government troops move in by sea. In this shadow war, the issues are complex, the progress obscure, but some things can be noted. A rebel government on Sumatra has resorted to force to oppose the centralized pro-communist tendencies of the Java-based Sukarno regime. Second, American sources are concerned with Russian aid going to the central government. And third, much of Indonesia's wealth is centered in Sumatra's oil fields. Rebel prisoners are taken in this sortie in which government troops recapture the Caltex fields at Pakanbaru. This is rebel equipment captured in the expedition. It's an M2. While the oil wells are Tommy returned guns. to operation and peace restored to the area, rebel guerrillas operate in the jungles just beyond. Leaflets tell the populace the campaign is directed only against rebel leaders. Wait, 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 what was... Sorry. The campaign is directed only... What is that? Say? Is that Inshallah? Maybe in <laughs> some kind of like... Yeah. Like that, you know, like maybe I don't know. Only against rebel leaders. They just spelled it wrong because they're just like some guy. Like, I don't know. They in Shadala or something like that. I have no idea what they're saying. In the meantime, American oil workers and their families remain. U.S. ships stand by in case of emergency. In case the Indonesian civil war pursues a more destructive course amidst natural wealth and beauty. We need to protect the white people that live here and work for the oil company. <laughs> Also, they did just sleep, slip in their end there that the islands are surrounded by U.S. <laughs> ships. Like, that's also <laughs> thrown in there. All right. So, in the early months of 1958, rebellion began to break out in one part of the Indonesia island chain, then another. CIA pilots took, off, took to the air to carry out bombing and strafing missions in support of the rebels. In Washington, Colonel Alex Kawalarung the Indonesian military attaché was persuaded by the agency to defect. He soon showed up in Indonesia to take char charge of the rebel forces. Yet, as the fighting dragged on into the spring, the insurgents proved unable to win decisive victories or take the offensive, although the CIA bombing raids were taking their toll. Sukarno later claimed that on a Sunday morning in April, a plane bombed a ship in the harbor of the island of Ambon, all those aboard losing their lives, as well as hitting a church which demolished the building and killed everyone inside. He stated that 700 casualties had resulted from the single run. <clears throat> on May 15th, a CIA plumbed the Ambon marketplace, killing a large number of civilians, on their way to church on Ascension on Thursday, the Indonesian government had to act to suppress public demonstrations. So, again, they're just bombing stuff. Here's a little more information on the bombing from the Wikipedia page. Uh, February 21st, 1958, Indonesian military obliterated the radio stations in Sumatra via bombings and established naval blockade along the coast. Not only did the CIA underestimate the Indonesian army, but the agency ap apparently failed to realize that many of the top commanders within the Indonesian army were fiercely anti-communist, having been trained in the United States, even calling themselves the Sons of Eisenhower. Ugh. This misstep led to American-aligned Indonesian military forces fighting American-aligned <laughs> rebel forces. Finally, in a desperate last ditch, in a desperate last ditch, the CIA pilots began bombing Indonesia's Seattle Islands on April 19, 1958, striking military and civilian targets, killing hundreds of civilians, and fomenting much anger among the Indonesian populace. Eisenhower had ordered that no Americans be involved in such missions, yet CIA Director Dulles ignored this order from the president. On May 18, 1958, 
Al Pope, an American citizen and CIA bomber, was downed over eastern Indonesia, revealing U.S. involvement. The 1958 CIA covert coup thus ended as complete and transparent failure. The failed coup would become one of the biggest failures in the history of the CIA. The CIA's inability to compete with Soviet covert intelligence proved costly in this instance and would prove costly in, a, in many other CIA operations against the Soviets. I know we'll, so, um, we'll get to it later, but it's just funny that, like, you know, the inability to compete with Soviet covert intelligence, like, little do they know that, like, that bar is actually, like, so fucking low, like, in terms of, like, international involvement and things. So, three days later, during another bombing run over Ambon, a CIA pilot, Al- Alien? Alien Lawrence Pope? I think it's Alan. It's oh, okay. Alan. All right. It's Alan? The, uh, the, the PDF. All right. Alan Lawrence Pope was shot down and captured. 30 years old from Perrine, Florida. Florida people in chat, you know, let me know if I'm mispronouncing that. Had flown 55 night missions over communist lines in Korea for the Air Force. He's, later, he spent two months flying through communist flak for the CIA to drop supplies to the French at Dien Bien Phu. Now, his luck had run out. He was to spend four years as a prisoner in Indonesia before Sukarno acceded to a request from Robert Kennedy for his release. Pope was captured carrying a set of incriminating documents, including those which established him as a pilot for the U.S. Air Force and the CIA airline cat like all men flying clandestine missions pope had gone through an elaborate procedure before taking off to sanitize him as well as his aircraft but he had apparently smuggled the papers aboard the plane for he knew that to be captured as an anonymous stateless civilian meant having virtually no legal rights and running the risk of being shot as a spy in accordance with custom as one does. A captured <laughs> U.S. military man, however, becomes a commodity of value for his captures while he remains alive. I love that they were like, yo, uh, Alan, you're going to go do this thing. Don't bring anything. Like, don't Nothing. you have to be completely anonymous. And he's like, oh, okay, yeah, I got you. Yeah. yeah. And he's like, yeah, sure. Why, idiots? Yeah. I'm, not, I'm not landing in Indonesia <laughs> with no fucking paperwork. You're crazy. It's like, yeah, I've flown like 55, close to 100 missions. I haven't been shot down yet. Uh, taking my paperwork with me. Yeah. I think that's like actually the same thing that happened with uh, the Iran-Contra too, isn't it? That like some dude was like running drugs or some shit. They finally he shot down the, the plane and he had like the CIA thing on him. Yeah. This is a super interesting like situation if you want to read this. Alan Lawrence Pope, born October 20th, 1928, died just three years ago on April 4th, (laughs) (laughs) was an American military and paramilitary aviator. He rose to international attention as the subject of a diplomatic dispute between the United States and Indonesia after a B-26 Invader aircraft was piloting in a Central Intelligence Agency covert operation was shot down over Ambon on May 18, 1958, during the Indonesian crisis. I love how that's a diplomatic crisis. Yeah, that uh, also it sounds it's more like, like an American crisis. Well, it also probably... sounds like an act of war. Right. Um, a diplomatic crisis sounds like there might be some kind of a quarrel with the United Nations, right. maybe about a treaty or something like yeah. that. It's like, hey, you're flying bombs <laughs> over like, us and you're killing children and blowing up churches. Right. You're like strafing our people. <laughs> yeah. Like, that, I like how they're like, it's a diplomatic issue, you know. It's a diplomatic you know issue. Diplomat, you yeah. know, diplomat can be. It's a trade route thing, you know? It's yeah. complicated, all right? Tariffs. You yeah. Know. Taxes, all that. Who cares about any of that? Pope's aviation career began with the United States Air Force, serving with distinction, flying bombing missions in the Korean War. Oh, 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 what a hero. distinction, right. Bombing and leveling, like, you know, everything that stands taller than a single story in northern in Korea. Yeah. Hero. yeah, real, real fucking stand-up guy. He transferred to the CIA in 1954 because I guess he just wasn't heartless uh, enough, you know? Like, he just 
what more vile, evil shit can I possibly accomplish in the name of American Empire? Which he also they served watched him bomb. They watched him bomb an entire village in Korea and come back and finish a hamburger like right. it was nothing. And they're yeah. like, that's the man that we need. Right. They watched him like hop out of that cockpit with just like a raging fucking hard on that like, yeah, wouldn't like, go this down. Is the man that we need. Yeah, this is our guy. Which he also served with distinction flying transport missions in the first Indochina War. In the Permesta Rebellion in Indonesia in 1958, Pope again flew bombing missions for the CIA, shot down by government forces. He was captured and held under house arrest for just over four years. What? That's it? No, mm-hmm. like, I would be torturing this asshole every fucking minute of every day for four years. In what? <sighs> Whatever. In 1960, an Indonesian court condemned him to death. Good, but considerable back-channel negotiations led to his release by President Sukarno in 1962. Bloodthirsty Sukarno. Pope returned to the United States and subsequently flew CIA covert missions in other theaters. Wow. Wow. Yeah, I like how he went back and he's like, you still got that plane? In 2005, France made Pope a Chevalier de la Legion d'Honneur for his service in Indochina. How? Like, Why France? How can the French campaign to can keep, like, what? That entire campaign in the fifties by France was to control Vietnam as a colony. How can they go back 40, 50, 60, 45 years later, forty to forty-five years later, and be like, "You're a fucking hero for helping us do that." You're a like, fu- you're, you're a fucking like, hero for probably doing something horrible. Like, yeah, well, not only that, it's completely unjustified. Like, this is a post World War II colonial dispute, which, like, right. bro, like, even if you, even if it's, it wasn't even like a mask on colonial pursuit, like the CIA was doing. It right. was like outright, like, hey, we were just occupied by the Nazis. We need our colony back. Yeah. And Vietnam and Ho Chi Minh being like, bro. What the fuck? <laughs> exactly. Like, what the fuck? Dude? It's like, like after World just... War One, where they're like, all the small countries need to be free and to decide yeah. their own paths and their own yeah. futures. And here comes like Ho Chi Minh just like knocking on the door like, hey, I, I heard what you were talking about. Get the fuck out of here. Get the, get him, the, the police. get that fucking, <laughs> get that expletive out of here. Exactly. The Indonesian government derived immediate material concessions from the United States as a result of the incident. Whether the Indonesians thereby agreed to keep silent about Pope is not known. But on May 27th, the pilot and his documents were presented to the world at a news conference, thus contradicting several recent statements by high American officials. Notable amongst these was President Eisenhower's declaration on April 30th concerning Indonesia, our policy is one of careful neutrality and proper deportment all the way through, so as not to be taking sides where it is none of our business. And on May 9th, an editorial in the New York Times had stated, it is unfortunate that high officials of the Indonesian government have given further circulation to the false report that the United States government was sanctioning aid to Indonesia's rebels. The position of the United States government has been made plain again and again. Our Secretary of State was emphatic. I think the Secretary of State is Dulles, by the way, was emphatic in this declaration that this country would not deviate from a correct neutrality. The United States is not ready to step in to help overthrow a constituted government. This is after Guatemala, by the way. Those are the hard facts. Jakarta does not help its case here by ignoring them. Tell them I'm emphatic. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) That'll, That'll really sell it. With the exposure of Pope and the lack of rebel success in the field, the CIA decided that the light was no longer worth the candle and began to curtail its support. By the end of June, Indonesian army troops loyal to Sukarno had effectively crushed the dissident military revolt. The Indonesian leader continued his adroit balancing act between the communists and the army until 1965 when the latter likely with the help of the cia finally overthrew his regime what do you mean likely with the help of the cia there's a whole nother chapter of this book where this happens like that you wrote about it i there's some stuff sometimes in this book that like i the way he writes you know where it's just like 
This isn't a, a choose-your-own, like, you know, fucking story novel where there's, like, other hypothetical yeah. endings. <laughs> there's, like, there's a whole other chapter in this book specifically about Indonesia. Specifically that you about wrote. Indonesia, <laughs> yeah, that you wrote and compiled the sources on. Why would you say likely with the help of the CIA? It either is or it isn't, all right? I, I'm certain. An expert. What do you mean likely? <laughs> Choose your, choose your own, own imperial <laughs> adventure. As the British labor, oh, okay. So now we're beginning Western Europe. That concludes. Right. Um, that concludes Indonesia for now. So and we'll be back in do Indonesia. You, do you want to play Ross's video now? Uh, uh, okay. 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 Yeah. yeah. And Saki, Saki to me. No, we are not advocating for killing the leader of a foreign country or regime change. That is not the policy of the United States. Well, this is about Ukraine. Good one. <laughs> well i mean like what was the official count uh it was like 500 something right there was somebody wrote a whole book about like all the various times they tried to assassinate him i think it's in the hundreds why is this thing? Right, there we go all right close that close that and uh should we should we also do the jfk jr thing now or like, at the end. okay i'll save it for the end so you want me to take this in uk beaten yeah that'd be cool all right western europe 1950s and 1960s at the british labor party conference in 1960s michael foot the party's future leader and a member of its left wing was accused of being a fellow traveler by then leader Hugh Gateskell. But you know, you know how the English are. There's probably like Hughie or something. They always pronounce it weird. Uh, Foot responded with a reference to Gateskell and others of the party's right wing. But who, he asked, are they traveling with? They, it turned out, had been traveling with the CIA for some years. Fellow passengers were Frenchmen, Germans, Dutch, Italians, and a host of other Western Europeans. Euros, all of them. All taking part in a CIA operation to win the hearts and minds of liberals, social democrats, and assorted socialists to keep them from the clutches of the Russian bear. It was an undertaking of major proportions. For some 20 years, the agency used dozens of American foundations, charitable trusts and the like, including a few of its own creation, as conduits for payments to all manner of organizations in the United States and abroad, many of which, in turn, funded other groups. So numerous were the institutions involved, so many were the interconnections and overlaps, that it is unlikely that anyone at the CIA had a grasp of the full picture, let alone exercise broad control over it or proper accounting. Because you know how famous the fucking CIA and the Pentagon is for passing their fucking audits. Yeah. <laughs> right? Yeah. So this is where we start to go full Charlie Day on It's Always Sunny with all the interconnected fucking strings on a fucking cork board. Right? This this is probably what you've all been waiting for. Right? We're getting, we're getting real, uh, real tension-y. Real, real strategy of attention. 
Oh yeah, tension. Yeah, strategy of tension. That is definitely what we're talking about. <laughs> the principal front organization set up by the CIA in this period was grandly named the Congress for Cultural Freedom. In June 1950, prominent liter literati and scientists of the United States and Europe assembled in the Titania Palace Theater in the American zone of Berlin. Before a large audience to launch the organization whose purpose was to defend freedom and democracy against the new tyranny sweeping the world. The CCF was soon reaching out in all directions with seminars, conferences, and a wide program of political and cultural activities in Western Europe, as well as India, Australia, Japan, Africa, and elsewhere. It had moreover more than 30 periodicals under its financial wing, including in Europe, Socialist Commentary, Censorship, Science and Freedom, Minerva, Soviet Survey or Survey, China Quarterly, and Encounter in Great Britain, Previs, Censure Contra Le Artes e La Pense, <laughs> um, Mundo Nuevo, and uh, Quidarnes, Quidarnos in France. Quidarnos. Spanish aimed at Latin America. Uh, perspective in Denmark, Ar Argumenten in Sweden, Iridalmi Utsag in Hungary, Der Monet in Germany, Forum in Australia, Tempo Presente in Italy, and Vision in Switzerland. So, this is the... the the, the CIA's attempt to appeal to the left to like, hey, you could be a socialist, but anti-communist or you can be on the left, but anti-communist. So this becomes anti a very, very, very pushed sentiment during these years. Oh, Grave Wax, I could probably answer that for you in uh, less than a sentence. Right. And it is probably because uh, what the fuck is it? Um, William Blum, he's not exactly like the biggest fan of the Soviet Union, and he kind of indicts them like throughout the book as like, well, the Soviets should have done more, right? Um, which is like kind of like understandable, but also like a I lot can... of things on the CIA website, by the way. Yeah, that too. But uh, that's most likely why this is on a CIA website. I think it was James Risen who said that CIA agents spend ninety nine percent of their time covering up their fuck-ups yeah well i mean like here's the thing about the cia they have an endless pool of money to just throw at whatever and they just have to be successful the one time you know it just doesn't matter if it works out in the long run so long as like they get at least some of it done so the congress for cultural you freedom backwards? what i don't think oh I no no you're right okay i'm sorry so, the Congress for Cultural Freedom was an anti-communist propaganda group founded on June 26, 1950 in West Berlin. That's the, the, the not-commie one. It was supported by the Central Intelligence Agency and its allies. At its height, the CCF was active in 35 countries. In 1966, it was revealed that the CIA was instrumental in the establishment and funding of the group. Congress aimed to enlist intellectuals and opinion makers in a war of ideas against communism. Trying to just, uh, you know, hedge every corner of the uh, market of ideas. Historian Francis Stonoer Sanders is writes 1999 whether they liked it or not whether they knew it or not what there were few writers poets artists historians scientists or critics in post-war europe whose names were not in some way linked to this covert enterprise a different slant on the origins and work of the congress is offered by peter coleman in his liberal conspiracy 1989 where he talks about a struggle for the mind of post-war europe and the world at Ooh. large. Well, thank oh, you, Sebs. Thank Welcome, you Raiders. So for the raid. Sebs and Raid. Sebs Raid. Sebs Raid. Sebs Raid. Sebs. So, do you want me to take this one? Uh, yes, oh, please. Yeah. Amongst the other media related organizations subsidized by the CIA in Europe at this time were the West German news agency DINA later known as DIPA. The International Association of Writers, PEN, located in Paris, certain French newspapers, the International Federation of Journalists, and Forum World Features, a news feature service in London whose stories were bought by some 140 newspapers around the world, including about 30 in the United States, 
amongst which were the Washington Post and four other major dailies. The Church Committee of the U.S. Senate reported that major U.S. dailies, which took the service, were informed that Forum World Features was CIA-controlled. The Guardian and the Sunday Times of Great Britain also used the service, which earlier had been called Forum Service. By 1967, according to one of Forum's leading writers, the new service had become perhaps the principal CIA media effort in the world. No small accomplishment when one considers that the CIA in its heyday was devoting a reported 29% of its budget to media and propaganda. What 29% is of what we don't fucking know because it could be anything could be a trillion dollars could be uh you know a thousand who fucking knows they can't pass a fucking audit yeah no i it, it's fucked that like you know they include the book but uh what are you gonna do you know Times were right earlier, but the video was long. Yeah, no, I get it. There's a lot of things that are just like weirdly on the CIA website, though. I'm trying to see if there's anything else like weird on there. I'm not sure. The church committee named after the person called church. Um, I forget. Do you remember what the church committee is named after? No. There's so many different organizations that work here that it's like. Oh, man. So, what, at the CIA, where we work? Yeah. <laughs> Um, another important recipient of CIA beneficents was Axel Springer, the West German press baron, who was secretly funneled about $7 million in the early 1950s to help him build up his vast media empire. Springer, until he died in 1985, was the head of the largest publishing conglomerate in Western Europe, standing as the tower of pro-Western and anti-communist sentiment. The publisher of the influential West German weekly Der Spiegel, Rudolf Augustine, had observed no single man in Germany before or after Hitler, with the possible exception of Bismarck or the two emperors, had so much power as Springer. His relationship with the CIA reportedly continued continued until at least the early 1970s. And it's wild because, like, what the the East Germany would only last for like another 12 years after that. Axel Cesar Springer, or I'm, I'm assuming it's pronounced Cesar, was a German publisher and founder of what is now Axel Springer SE, the largest media publishing firm in Europe. By the early 1960s, his print titles dominated West German daily press market. His Bild Zeitung became the nation's tabloid. In the late 1960s, Springer entered into confrontation with the emergent New Left. Hostile coverage of student protests and continuing rightward drift in editorial comment were met with boycotts and printing press blockades and, in 1972, the bombing of the company offices by the Red Army faction, the Beta Meinhof Gang. In the late 1970s, exposés of journalistic malpractice by the investigative reporter Gunther Walroff led to press council reprimands. Sometimes referred to as Germany's Rupert Murdoch, Springer, with the countersuits and minor divestments, was able to ride out public criticism of his editorial ethics and market dominance. Springer engaged in private diplomacy in Moscow in 1958 and with greater recognition in Jerusalem in 1966 and 1967. Interesting years to be in Jerusalem. In addition to promotion and defense of the values of the Western family of nations and the North Atlantic Alliance, Springer declared, reconciliation of Jews and Germans and support for the vital rights of the state of Israel to be a leitmotif of his company's journey journalism yep so this is the guy that really received seven million dollars from the cia to become the Ru rupert murdoch of germany <clears throat> and a light motif is, yeah. stands for a recurrent theme throughout a musical or literary composition associated with a particular person idea or situation i wonder what the situation is that he's referring to that could be between uh, jews and germans wonder so um the originator of the american program the head of the cia's international organizations division tom braden later wrote that the agency placed one imperative operative in the ccf and that another became an editor 
of the CCF's most important magazine, Encounter. We've talked about Encounter before. I don't know if anybody remembers. Presumably, there was at least one CIA agent or officer in each of the funded groups, Braden stated that the agents could propose anti-communist programs to the official leaders of the organizations. He added, however, that it was a policy to protect the integrity of the organization by not requiring to support every aspect of official American policy. That's where they get you. Um, the cultural freedom journals appealed to the non-Marxist left. Forum, by contract, was conservative, generally eschewing the class struggle for excessive nationalization of industry. Oh, no, 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 not for, and both of those things, not... Oh, not oh okay, other. so, so neither. Of <laughs> <laughs> neither of those. So not uh, left at all. <laughs> so not... They subscribed to Daniel, Daniel Bell's The End of Ideology thesis, the raise d'atre, d'atre, do you know how to say that? Raison uh, d'atre? Ra raison d'atre. D'atre. Yeah, of which know, was that, that since no one could call for dying for capitalism with a straight face, the idea of dying for socialism or any other ide ideology had to be discredited. At the same time, the journals advocated a reformed capitalism, a capitalism with a human face. Yeah, this is kind of why I'm like, no, I think that like the whole like Frankfurt School postmodern left bullshit is nonsense and not worth the amount of time or the struggle to even wrap your fucking head around it. I, I, I'm sorry. Encounter was a literary magazine founded in 1953 by poet Stepan Spender and journalist Irvine Crystal. The magazine ceased publication in 1991. Wow, I wonder why 1991? Published in the United Kingdom, it was an Anglo-American intellectual and cultural journal originally associated with the anti-Stalinist left. The magazine received covert funding from the Central Intelligence Agency, who, along with MI6, discussed the founding of an Anglo-American left-of-center publication Good God, intended to counter the idea of Cold War neutralism. Yeah, the magazine. The Anglo part that they had, it had to be Anglo American. <laughs> you can't leave out the Anglos, man. <laughs> The magazine was rarely critical of American foreign policy and generally shaped its content to support the geopolitical interests of the United States government. Hmm. Suspicious. Spender served as literary editor until 1967 when he resigned. The revelation of the covert CIA funding of the magazine occurred that year. Hmm. He had heard rumors but had not been able to confirm them. Thomas W. Braden, who's head, who headed the CIA's International Organizations Division operations between 1951 and 54, said that the money for the magazine came from the CIA and few outside the CIA knew about it. We had placed one agent in a Europe-based organization of intellectuals called the Congress for Cultural Freedom, Frank Kermode. Uh, replaced Spender, but he is too, he too resigned when it became clear that CIA was involved. Roy Jenkins uh, observed that earlier contributors contributors were aware of U.S. funding, but believed it came from philanthropists, including a Cincinnati gin distiller. Encounter experienced its most successful years in terms of readership and influence under Melvin J. Lasky, who succeeded Crystal in 1958 and would serve as the main editor until the magazine ceased publication in 1991. Other editors in this period included D.J. Enright. Every it's just Enright. wild, like, how, like, huge this magazine was. Like, imagine if you were this guy, this guy, Steven Spender, like, he was really like, yeah, like, this is it. Like, imagine, like, just finding out one day, you're like, what do you mean this is all CIA information? What? what? I thought we were, I, I thought we I, were being, like, propped up by a gin distiller in Cincinnati. Yeah. That Look, the yeah, ad. Exactly. See, it's it's for Cincinnati gin. Yeah. We don't have I ads for the it. CIA. I believe all this stuff, like, like I believed in anti-Stalinism and all this stuff, and they're just like, "Sorry, kid." Sucks to suck sometimes. Also, it's yeah. kind of funny that, like, I guess immediately after the fall of the Soviet Union, they're just like, "Oh, we don't need this shit anymore." Yeah, throw fuck that out. <laughs> <laughs> I wonder how Steven Spender felt about that when they were like, "Oh, fuck this." Uh, you're fired. <laughs> <laughs> don't let the door hit you on the way out. Get the fuck. So, 
Also, I don't know if anybody remembers this, but I love to bring up the IRD, the Information Research Department. Yeah. This is one of the IRD projects that also ah. was like a joint venture with the CIA. Right. So it was like British intelligence and this. And then they just like get some like young whippersnapper. It's like want to be journalist. And they're like, all right, kid, here's your chance. There's this whole passion and everything. And then yeah. he's like, this is all a CIA front. And I'm like, it always has been. Right. Always has yeah. been. It's like, but, <laughs> but we were the, the real left, I thought. We were standing against the, 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 the Stalinists. It's like, yeah, no, kid, what the fuck are you talking about? We, we yeah. literally, like, we're this close to making it a Nazi rag. We're spreading publications about murdering fucking <laughs> co uh, anti-colonial demonstrators in Indonesia and shit like that. What are you talking about? You wrote a whole article about why it's good that we overthrew Lumumba. What are you talking about? You're writing an article <laughs> right now about how they're uh, murdering puppies during in, in Northern Ireland. It's like, what are you talking about? You're more deluded than we are. At least we we're, know we're monsters. We factor in any of that. <laughs> To the cold warriors in Washington who were paying the bills, however, the idea of reforming capitalism was of minimal interest. What was of consequence was the commitment of the magazines to a strong, well-armed, and united Western Europe, allied to the United States, which would stand as a bulwark against the Soviet bloc. Support for the common market and NATO. Critical analysis of what was seen as the intellectual component of international communist subversion. Skepticism of the disarmament, pacifism, and neutralism espoused by the likes of the prominent campaign for nuclear disarmament in Great Britain. Criticism of U.S. foreign policy took place within the framework of a Cold War assumptions. For example, that a particular American intervention as not the most effective way of combating communism. Not that there was anything wrong with the intervention, intervention per se, or is that the United States was supporting the wrong side. Because we're, we're not going to print that the United States is doing something wrong. We're just going to say that they could have done it better. Exactly. It is really interesting you know to think about how this may continue today like oh it know, absolutely if is. there is like a <laughs> equivalent to encounter magazine maybe even on twitch who knows right. um that is like you know this type of a project i mean like i kind of i i, I i'm sure there's definitely a book i want to see what michael brooks's book is about uh you know like about the internet or whatever but i feel oh, no, like there is, there is a book there is a book about this it's called bread tube is cia <laughs> <laughs> you know what I'm talking about? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But like, fucking, what, what the fuck is it? I think that this, um, it, it got to such a point, especially after the Cold War, where like it may have started out as a CIA front, but by the time it grew legs into like the '90s, it no longer needed the CIA to kind of yeah. corral them. It's just kind of like you're, th you've trained them naturally to, right. to, yeah. to you feel have this changed way. the public perception in such a way that it is yeah. just being continually proliferated through generation. It's actually compounding. Yeah. It's actually just compounding more yeah. and more and more to the point where it's a completely hands-off project at this point. They don't need yeah. to be doing the things that they had to in the 1950s when. Even in Britain, there was a significant communist contingent and things like that. Like, yeah. Like, you, you no longer, like, need to have, like, CIA funding or have, like, you know, a Fed, you know, pretending to be a leftist involved in it. Like, you know, these are people that genuinely believe these things and, like, genuinely believe that, like, they're on the left. Kazoontite. Kazoontite. Thank you. All right. So, this is also my favorite part of this, too. One of my favorite parts. Private publications such as these could champion <laughs> views which official U.S. government organs like the Voice of America could not and still be credible. The same was true of the many other private organizations on the CIA payroll at this time. I love this because it's like, this is the, like, a dominant thought, like, in terms of, like, free media, in that if anything state-funded it has to be a lie and anything that's private is the free press and it's so funny because the cia can literally just pay for a fucking llc and be like that's free press baby <laughs> it's free that's free 
It's free. It's free, it's free it's, as I've ever seen media. It's in the free market, um, ain't it? <laughs> in 1960, CND and other elements of the Labour Party's left wing succeeded in winning over the party's conference to a policy of complete unilateral nuclear disarmament and neutrality in the Cold War. Could you imagine? In addition, two resolutions supporting NATO were voted down. Although the Labour Party was not in power at the time, the actions carried considerable propaganda and psychological value. Washington viewed the turn of events with little, with not a little anxiety, for such elements could easily spread to the major parties of other NATO countries. Right? Could you imagine if, like, the Labour Party got in power? It was like we're done with NATO, NATO neutrality, and nuclear disarmament. Could you imagine what would happen if England actually pursued those things in 1960? I feel like that that we would have like the Seventh Fleet or whatever outside yeah. of like you know the the it, outside of English ports and whatnot, and we'd be like invading their fucking government. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we we would be sending Marines into like you know the the fucking what what, what is it the the palace or whatever Buckingham Palace? I don't fucking care. I don't know. Buckingham, yeah. yeah. So. The right wing of the Labour Party, you know, as if they have a left wing anymore, which had close, not to say intimate, connections to the Congress for Cultural Freedom, Encounter, New Leader, and other CIA assets and fronts, undertook... These were also right around when they started throwing down the word tanky. Right? Yeah, yeah, because of uh, Hungary. Hungary yeah. I think it was Hungary that came first, and then Czechoslovakia came after. I think. I could be, correct me, Chad, if I'm wrong. So, undertook a campaign to reverse the disarmament resolution. The committee set up for the purpose issued an appeal for funds and soon could report that many small donations had been received. Together with a large sum from a source that wished to remain anonymous, over the next year, there was sufficient funding for a permanent office, a full-time paid chairman and paid staff, field workers, traveling expensive, tons of literature sent to a large mailing list within the movement, a regular bulletin sent free, etc., etc. Their opponents could not come close to matching this propaganda blitz. At the 1961 conference, the unilateralist and neutralist decisions were decisively overturned and the labor party returned to the nato fold so you want to know something interesting pat what i at one point was a trotskyist and i vaguely remember us doing like a whole fucking reading that some other trotskyist had written about like you know the english labor party and how like you know they were super socialist right yep. because they were trotskyist right yep. and i'm seeing here um, you know, unless, like, this happened in, like, the 40s, which I doubt, that, uh, the Labor Party has kind of, uh, always been, uh, uh, effectively, uh, sort of been under the control of the CIA. Well, it seems like the way that I'm reading it is that there actually was some pretty leftist tendencies. Right. I'm not saying that there wasn't. I'm just saying that, like, the ones that won. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> that there was, like... A point in time where they were like yo we need to be neutral in the cold war let's do nuclear disarmament and let's we're done with nato right. then the united states was like okay how about i just uh flood millions of dollars into there for your opposition and it's gone and it's gone and that uh that took care of that little little issue um Supporters of the CIA have invariably defended the agency's sundry activities in Western Europe on the grounds that the Russians were the first to be so engaged there and had to be countered. Whatever truth there may be in this assertion, the fact remains, as Tom Braden has noted, that the American effort to spread to some fields where they, the Russians, had not even begun to operate. Braden doesn't specify which fields, but it seems that political parties was one. The CIA had working financial relationships with leading members of the West German Social Democratic Party, two parties in Austria, the Christian Democrats in Italy, who we covered on here, mm -hmm. and the Liberal Party, in addition to the Labour Party in Britain, and probably at least one party in every other Western European country, all of which were to be independent of either superpower, something the various communist parties, whether supported by the Soviet Union or not, could never get away with. And it's like, even, even if when they, they try to, <laughs> what? I think like, even if they are supported by the Soviet Union, it's like the Soviet Union sends them like, here's like a thousand dollars. Good luck. Stop. Um, Bruce Jeff's like, oh, hey, hey, kid, what's up? And like goes in his pocket and he's like, shh, 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 and get you. There. Yeah. This is why not. <laughs> good luck, comrade. Devise. Pat's on the head. <laughs> on the head with him, but yeah, good job. That poor bastard. 
<laughs> yeah, that kid's that kid's fucked. <laughs> that kid's gonna die in a jail cell. <laughs> they gotta hit him with the heart attack gun. Yeah, don't spend it all in one place. Yeah, <laughs> but like, also, it's like it's such a joke that they're like the Russians were here first. When like, meanwhile, we're reading in like Greece, we're like right. World War II isn't even over yet. World War yeah. II has not. The bodies aren't cold on the Eastern Front. People. And are... meanwhile, the CIA is like, we gotta fucking do something. Well, the CIA didn't exist yet, but they're like, we gotta do something. We gotta do something now. You like, know what I mean? Like, 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 like people are still like walking out of the concentration camps, and the CIA yeah. is just like, you know. We gotta do something to combat the Soviets from taking over this. <laughs> like, yeah, the com there's like there's communists in Greece. We gotta do something now. Like, yeah, they've been fighting the Nazis the whole time. Well, wh where else yeah. would they be? <laughs> like, so that's that's what I mean. And I love them being like, oh well, you know, the Russians were already there. This is the Soviets, and it's like in Guatemala. What? What were they doing there? Why would they be we're in Guatemala? <laughs> they they just got destroyed. <laughs> And they're like, like they're pulling out of the rubble of Stalingrad. Like, get to Guatemala now. I, I, Lennon, I, I kind of agree with you. I think that Henry Wallace probably would have been far more uh, willing to go along with the original plan that you know FDR likely agreed with. That like you know, let's uh, let's like work together. But at least like you know, at the very best, I won't fuck with you. You won't fuck with me. All right. And mm -hmm. we'll, we'll like, you know, uh, commit to that agreement, right? And Truman held a pillar over his face. <laughs> <laughs> crazy old bastard. We gotta drop the bomb. You hear that Harry S. <laughs> Truman's middle name is S? What do you mean? S. There's no, like, name? It's just... No, it's just S. It's just the letter S? Did his parents understand the concept behind a middle name? <laughs> like, like Homer J. Simpson. Did they? Did they understand? Have you ever seen the episode of The Simpsons where the whole show, the whole episode, is about Homer finding out what his middle name is, and it's Homer J. Simpson, and then and at the end he finds out that it's J. A. Y. Homer J. Simpson. <laughs> then he's like, finally now I know I'm Homer <laughs> J. <laughs> no, I've never seen that. Um, hold on, Harry S. Truman middle name. Did you know that Harry S. Truman actually had no middle name? His parents gave him the middle initial S to honor and please his grandfathers, Anderson Schip Truman and Solomon Young. Since the S did not stand for a name, Harry didn't use a period after it for most of his life. What? <laughs> yeah, it's a little, uh, a little, little. So how did that make really the quick. grandfathers happy? If like the neither, I think only one of their names started with an S, and like the last name of one of them started with an, whatever. I don't care. Fuck Truman. <laughs> Fucking, the media provides another case in point. Neither Braden nor anyone else apparently has cited examples of publications or news agencies in Western Europe pro-communist or anti-NATO, etc., which ostensibly independent in the Cold War were covertly funded by the Soviet Union. More importantly, it should be borne in the mind that all the different types of enterprises and institutions supported by the CIA in Western Europe were supported by the agency all over the Third World for decades on a routine basis without a Russian counterpart in sight. Oh, wow. Oh, this looks so fucking good. Thank you. I love you. The growing strength of the left in post-war Europe was... M oh, fuck me. <laughs> the growing strength of the left in post-war Europe was motivation enough for the CIA to develop its covert programs. And this was a circumstance deriving from World War II and the economic facts of life. Not from Soviet propaganda and manipulation. This kind of reminds me of a lot of things today. Uh, where... I, I, while you were reading that, I was like trying to find out. I was I googled I, Soviet funded media, yeah. and I can't. I'm trying to like see if there's like an example of like a like uh, international media outlet. Um, there's a lot of stuff coming up about within the Soviet Union, like oh mass media in the Soviet Union. Thank you, Potato oh. King. Oh hey, what's up, Potato King? Thank you so much. Um, I'm trying to find like if there's some kind of like a equivalent to what the CIA is doing no, right now, that... where they're just like masquerading private press as like as their own. And I'm I'm struggling to find. Does anybody in chat know of any? 
Like, that's the thing is that even today, whenever, like, you know, there's all these What different... else would I even Google? Like, Soviet-funded media companies. I tried that, too. I can't... F- I'm trying to... F- what, what, what else would you... I guess, like, um... What would it be, like... Soviet, uh... Overt media? Soviet... Soviet-backed media, or... I don't even know. There's active measures which is a political warfare conducted by Soviet or Russian government since the 1920s. It included offensive programs such as espionage, propaganda, sabotage, and assassination. Um, but it's just funny how, like, like Tinker, Taylor, Soldier, Spy, or whatever, they make it seem like, you know, oh, there's, like, this international, like, spy war thing, competition between them and the Soviets, and it's like, no, dog. That never happened. It doesn't exist like that. The Soviets, like, literally didn't put any kind of effort like that into this. Which I think is William Bloom's, like, main problem. He's like, how come the Soviets didn't do that? Okay, I can't read into this all right now. But I'm, I, it's... I'm not finding any actual, like, media outlets like that. Oh, hey, Kay, how do you say thank you? right i agree i'm just not saying like i wouldn't put it past the soviet union like, right. there was obviously the kgb there was obviously espionage activities right. we've even talked about it with um kim uh yeah who who what was his name um who were the spies this the, the double agents that we were oh, talking kim about philby before. kim philby, philby yeah. right obviously they had spies they did but in terms of like media and propaganda ultimately the soviets like completely fucking lost that war yeah i don't put anything past uh you know, international, especially like a huge superpower like the Soviet Union to have like an espionage yeah. department and things like that. But I'm like this level of um, international social distortion, you know, not to, uh, it sounds so corny when I say it like that because of that stupid band. <laughs> but, you know, like, I'm just trying to see if like, there's like this level, like obviously you can probably say things about like whatever the media within the Soviet Union may have been skewed to a very, very specific type of ideology. Um, but I'm talking about like, creating fake front companies that appear to be independent and they're just being funneled money and information by the Soviet Union. Yeah, no, there's there's none of that. There's nothing, there's no like, you know, um, writers Voice work. Of Ameri- <laughs> the, the, the Radio Free America. Yeah, there's no Radio Free America. There's no like writers workshop out in Iowa that's being funded by the Soviet Union. There's no, there's nothing like that. What would be the equivalent? I'm trying to think of like, so if the United States created Encounter or the CIA created Encounter, which was like taking like the extreme position, but then making it like more palatable, but anti, what would be the Soviet opposite to that? Would it be like an alt-right magazine or something like that? Like, or like an alt-light magazine or something? I don't even know, to be honest. A a Soviet controlled like alt-right magazine. I think that's it. The, the closest thing that one could argue in the most insane way, right, is were you aware of the Confucian schools that were operating in America? They were, no. like, I think funded by, like, the, the, the Chinese government, but they weren't being used for some ulterior motive. They were being used to, like, teach people fucking Mandarin and, like, teach kids Mandarin because, like, you know, three out of five people in the fucking world are in China, and it's just like, oh, we want to develop closer relations and stuff, and the U.S. took that as, like, no, these are these are being used to subvert American, you know, uh, children and whatnot. It's three out of five people? Yeah, it's like three out of five, three out of five people in the world are in China There's right now. Three billion people in the world, right? Yeah. And what's China's population? Uh, I don't even know off the top of my head. 1.4 billion. So yeah, if there's 8 billion, that means probably close to 3, which is insane. Well, I know, not 3 out of 5. It, so that means that there's almost 2 out of 8, which reduces to 1 out of 4. So like a quarter of the people. What do I keep telling you? I don't know. One of I'm us always sorry. tells the truth and the other one always lies. It's up to chat to figure out which one it is. And I'm not good at math. Hassan uh, has, he always says, has a new bookshelf. You're saying that... Um, um, no mention of ideological influence, just about money. Are you talking about the Soviet Union funneling money into like a shit, like a puppet media company? I'd love to. I, I, w- I would be interested in knowing the name of it. Yeah, I look it up. yeah. I want to watch uh, Soviet-funded like Western media. <laughs> 
especially if it's not just like Soviet good, if it's like something subversive where it's meant to, because that's the thing about Encounter is that it's supposed right. to be parading as a leftist. Like, I want to see what the Soviet alternative to that would be like, like, man, we don't really love capitalism that much. It's not that great, is it? Friendly firms <laughs> like money, money laundering. <laughs> Full house turns out to be Soviet propaganda. I would love that. In the UK media company. UK media company is the name of the company. John Stamos turns out to be like a Cold War Soviet sleeper agent. Yeah. Like, what it has to be, it has to be like a... a, a, a something that's very, very like nominally pro-US, but just continually like exposes its faults in like an unassuming way. Where it's like... God, don't you just love living in America? You know, my teeth are falling out of my skull, but man, this is the land of the free. Like, I'm trying to think of like what that would be. Um, Sesame Street? Oh, Star Trek, maybe? Maybe. Gene Roddenberry is actually a communist. I don't know. You want to know who it might be? George Lucas. George maybe it was George Lucas. Maybe George, it was George Lucas. George Lucas is a Soviet sleeper agent. Right. That's true. Without a That's country true. to go back to anymore. So, um, so now we're getting in the Gladio. Married with Stalin. <laughs> um, the rationale behind it was your standard Cold War paranoia. There's a good chance the Russians will launch an unprovoked invasion of Western Europe. And if they defeated the Western armies and forced them to flee, certain people had to remain behind to harass the Russians with guerrilla warfare and sabotage and act as liaisons with those abroad. The stay-behinds would be provided with funds, weapons, communication equipment, and training exercises. The planning for this covert paramilitary network, codenamed Operation Gladio... What? No, I was just saying, you, as you were saying Operation Gladio, oh. I was like, there it is! Italian for sword began in 1949, involving initially the British, the Americans, and the Belgians. It eventually established units in every non-communist country in Europe, including Greece and Turkey, and neutral Sweden and Switzerland, with the apparent exceptions of Ireland and Finland. The question of whether the units were more under the control of national governments or NATO remains purposely unclear. Although from an operational point of view, it appears the CIA and various other intelligence services were calling the shots. Um, so I mean, this too, if you look down here, this Bund Deutscher Jugend, uh, alliance thing, when we read an earlier chapter, we went into this. This is a, a very interesting example of this. So, uh, this was a politically active German association with right wing to right wing extremists and anti communist leanings founded in 1950. In the beginning of 1953, the BDJ and its paramilitary arm, the Tennischer Deinst were forbid forbidden as extreme right-wing organizations because of the planned murder of roughly 40 people and the creation of a secret organization. It was founded on June 23, 1950 in Frankfurt, Maine. The founder and main theorist and later chairman of the BDJ was Paul Luth. The CIA cryptonym for the BDJ was KM Prude and for the Teichner Deinst LC Prow. <laughs> The project outline is a in a declassified CIA file states the following objectives. The utilization of the League during the October 15th elections in Eastern Germany, consolidating the League as a permanent nationwide organization, employing the League in political warfare operations, and guerrilla warfare and sabotage training of selected segments of the League's membership. So this is just one example of these stay-behinds um, in Western Germany that they're talking about. In April 1951, the Tinsner-Deins Technical Service, a secret subsection of BJ, was founded on the programmatic basis of the partisan writings by Paul Luth with the aim in mind to form an armed resistance movement against quote unquote Bolshevism. The operation ran under the name LC Prow BDJ Apparat. As of 1951, the budget for one year was $125? No, no thousand. No, yeah. Okay, 125000 The group was allegedly founded as part of CIA's program of creating guerrilla and stay behind groups in Germany and Western Europe that would fight the Soviets should they occupy Western Europe during a future confrontation. The CIA was training them in covert guerrilla warfare to be part of this future resistance movement. Many members of the BJ were veterans of the Wehrmacht, Wehrmacht and the Waffen-SS. I love that it says right here that it was allegedly founded as part of the CIA's program. Go down. Meanwhile, it's already talking about CIA declassified right. documents that state its explicit purposes. So then, in a, a 1952 raid by local police, Ooh, sorry, units, 
on the BDJ's premises revealed that the U.S. funded the organization at a monthly sum of $50,000 and supplied it with arms, munitions, and explosives. Like, who edited this fucking Wikipedia article? Like, they go... The they go yeah, they go up into the top part, and, that part and they're like, this was allegedly something yeah. that the CIA did. And then they're like, 1952 raid proved, revealed <laughs> that the U.S. funded the organization and gave it arms, ammunitions, and explosives. A weapons cache consisting of machine guns, grenades, light artillery guns, and explosives were found in Odenwald, near Frankfurt am Main. Seized documents also contained an assassination list naming 40 German political leaders, hmm. mainly politicians of the German Social Democratic Party, SPD. Among them were Herbert Weiner, the former head of the SPD partner, party, Eric Olenhauer, the Hessian minister of the interior, Heinrich Zinken, and mayor of Hamburg, and Bre Bremen. For a case of emergency scenario, break a glass in case... The BDJ had already funneled members of the S members in the SPD. The U.S. Army Counterintelligence Corps took over custody of the German BDJ members and denied the West German authorities access to them in the following months because the authorities intended to indict the members on charges of unlawful possession of weapons and planned murder. CIC agents continued to seize all remaining documents and refused to surrender them to West German authorities. And as a result of the ongoing investigation, U.S. authorities admitted to having financed the BDJ for the training of guerrillas in case of war with the Soviet Union. So this is so funny that, like, before they're like, this was allegedly set up by the... By the can you just read... I just want to see what it said was alleged. Can you go up just a little bit? Okay. The group was allegedly founded as part of the CIA's program of creating guerrilla stay-behind groups in Germany and Western Union that would fight the Soviets should they occupy Western Europe. Go down. And then just a couple inches down, it says, uh, U.S. authorities admitted to having finance the BDJ for training of guerrillas in case of war with the Soviet Union. It's like, <laughs> it's it like, it's it's interesting that they would keep the word allegedly in there. Um, yes, strongly right wing members of the SS and the Wehrmacht. Yeah. So this is just an example of the sordid characters that were being, um, you know, the anti-communist crusaders who would be used for Gladio. You know, that guy. That's not even a guy. That's a rank. Yeah. But that's still a guy. Yeah. That would be the guy <clears throat> if they were looking for a guy. Yes, like this guy. Because, yeah. again, always remember this. Who is more willing to uh, uh, murder their own people in the name of anti-communism than a Nazi? Right. Well, and also... Just to put it clear, they had lists of names of people that they were going to be executing. People who were in no way Bolsheviks. Like, we're talking about, like, the random mayor of a town and social democratic party leaders and things like that. This went far deeper than just being like, oh, I don't know, we're just armed here just in case the Soviets come, which they definitely are going to. Um, you know, there was, like, terroristic activity that was being financed and advocated for by these groups. Give me one minute. I just got to put my food away. Okay. Because we're going to get into a lot here. There's a lot of, like, murky water here around Gladio where they, um, there's a lot of, like, plausible deniability that's built into this. Excuse me. Where, like, there's so many degrees of separation that it, en that it lends this plausible deniability to the CIA in some of these situations. So I want this, uh, the BDJ situation to remain in everyone's mind when the United States claims that they never, um, you know, that sure there was like stay behind groups, but they never were instructed to do any kind of terrorism or anything like that. Uh, just remember this situation, which I believe, um, pretty, pretty succinctly spells out that that was in fact the case. And there was U S knowledge of it as they were being supplied with lists and explosives and things like that. Um, one day Johnny will return and we'll get this slide moving on. All right. Um, so yeah, so we're gonna, you know, Gladio. Um, oh God, there's so much. I have a video after this, I'm sorry. I need Johnny to come back to free me from this slide prison that I'm currently in. Um, so yeah, and the, the BDJ only lasted in 1953 as they were banned for being a right-wing extremist group. Pretty pat. Yeah, thank you, Sam. Yeah, I'm currently in the bondage of, uh, bondage of slave, slave bondage, slide bondage. Uh, 
There he is. All right. Where the fuck were we on the Nazis? We were just moving forward. Okay. I think it was a video too. That's next. That would have been perfect for you to go. <sighs> um, I wish you told me that. Right before. This is, I, I really don't like this channel for many reasons. Oh, the cold war um, one. This is the, I think they're kind right? of fucking annoying. Yeah. I think, I think man, mostly it's, I think the guy's annoying, but man, if you're into this, it's part of history literally these do these people have a video for every single thing that i'm yep. looking up every single thing they have like multiple videos on it like okay. that sicarno thing multiple things on sicarno most of it's like god they just have every phase of it they have videos of it on um i don't agree with them on everything but there's not that many short videos on gladio and 14 minutes is about as short as it's getting on this so i figured that this was going to be a relatively I would consider them somewhat neutral, I'd say, is that they have a lot of, like, Western bends on their interpretations, but also think. they but also they criticize the West quite a bit because I don't think you really can get away with having any kind of a legitimate take on the Cold War and not do that. No, otherwise you just wind up, like, looking like the History Channel. Yeah. All right. You ready? On the 8th of November 1990, at the 449th session of the Italian Senate, the then Prime Minister Giulio Andriotti revealed the existence of a secret organization that had been operating in Italy and other Western European countries for more than four decades. <laughs> this is how the general public first heard about Operation Gladio. Gladio was the codename given to the Italian section of a large stay behind network created by US security services in cooperation with several European countries, including the UK, Belgium, France, Greece, West Germany, Norway, Sweden, Finland, Denmark, and the Netherlands. The purpose of this operation was to set up a covert network of elite fighting units. In case of an invasion of Western Europe by forces of the communist bloc, these groups would immediately organize the resistance against the invaders by waging guerrilla war. I'm your host David, and this week we are going to look at the creation and plans for the US stay behind actions in the event of a Soviet attack in Europe. This is the Cold War. I'm not gonna lie, I kinda like his drip, and I sorta like the, the set that he's got behind him. I, I enjoy really, that, this but isn't the set that as revealed by Andriotti, that. the Italian operation was kicked off by a 1951 memo by the head of the intelligence services of the armed forces to the chief of staff in which he, quote, proposed the creation of an organization to gather intelligence and to conduct sabotage operations on the national territory in case of enemy occupation, end quote. Andriotti admitted that at its height, Gladio could count on 622 operatives. The criteria for recruitment was yeah. Yeah, physical fitness, that. appropriate military experience, loyalty to the Republic institutions, and their perceived ability to escape deportation or internment in case of a communist invasion. Selected operatives were trained in a secret facility near the seaside town of Alghero, Sardinia. Alghero boasts sandy beaches with clear waters, stunning medieval churches, great food, and an average high of 14 degrees Celsius in February. You can actually sign me up for that anytime. But anyway, Gladio personnel were trained in guerrilla tactics and exfiltration techniques. Hmm. They were then assigned to posts in northeastern Italy, regions most likely to be invaded first. Sure. There, they had access to 139 secret weapons caches to be used also as rallying points to recruit a more sizable resistance force after All the invasion. It, it is wild to me too that it's like, well, that is if you, even if you believe that narrative that there's this much right. planning and money and everything going around for like a Soviet invasion that I don't think there's any evidence that was ever going to happen. Now, correct me if I'm wrong, right? But uh, where was uh, most of the Communist Party? In the world? Like in Italy. The South? Or was it the North? I don't remember. Because I'm pretty certain no, that's 2019. Uh, God damn, I thought yeah, I was hoping this was us. like, nah, it's not going to help us. Never mind. I know that. Um, I think it was the South. Was it? I thought it was more of the North. And that's that could why be wrong. they were doing that. That could be wrong. I'm ready to be wrong. 
I, me too. I mean, like, I, I'll yeah. probably keep. No, there's not enough time. There's like less than four minutes left. Uh, maybe I'll click clack away and see if I can find it. But uh... no. Yep, there you go. Now, although the Italian Gladio was the first NATO-sponsored clandestine army to be revealed, hence why the name stuck with the general public, becoming synonymous with the whole operation, it actually wasn't the first to be created. The 1951 memo I referenced also clarified that similar stay-behind networks had already been readied in other Allied countries. However, Italy does boast some interesting dry runs for the full operation. But you know what, before I get there, let's trace the precedents that inspired the creation of Gladio. The Stay Behind model was similar to the resistance and partisan organizations that had fought against the Axis in the Second World War, but with an important difference regarding supplies. The French resistance, as an example, had to rely on Allied paradrops or stealing weapons from the German occupiers. In the case of Gladio, however, NATO believed it safer to create an advanced secret weapons cache, ensuring their units would be well supplied from the get-go. The other difference is that partisan fighting units in the Second World War traditionally we're only originated after a country had been- What's that? I said, we're communists. Yeah, we're communists. The partisans, the big difference also was that the partisans were communists. I think I found it. Okay. So we're talking about like the 1948 election, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it was the North for sure. Yeah. Yeah, it was more in the North, and that's why yeah, I was like, right. hmm, interesting well, that us, they would want to put them that in the the, the Northeast mm -hmm. there. <laughs> one of us always lies, and one of us always tells the truth. <laughs> <laughs> and it's up to chat to figure it out. Been invaded by the Axis. There's one notable example, however, of a resistance movement that was pre-planned and which may have served as a model for future stay-behind networks. Back in July 1940, the German High Command formulated the first plans for Operation Felix, the capture of Gibraltar. Huh. The plan was led by Admiral Willem Canaris, the head of the Abwehr, the secret service of the German military. The, the German plan involved military. German troops entering Spain from the French border and then seizing Gibraltar from the north. Now, Canaris and his organization were known to oppose the Nazi regime, and therefore the Admiral may have alerted the Allies to Operation Felix. The British Secret Service then launched an ambitious counter-operation to create a stay-behind network in Spain. Should the German Spain. army cross the Iberian Peninsula to take Gibraltar, they would be harassed by guerrilla units composed of anti-Francoist elements, trained and armed by the Allies. The name of the operation, by the way, Goldeneye. And the main coordinator on the ground, none other than Ian Fleming. Of course, Operation Felix never took place, and so Goldeneye did not materialize. Unless you count Fleming's Jamaican estate, or the 1995 Bond movie and subsequent N64 game. But back to our story. Which Planting resistance movements in advance of a foreign invasion was not a concept exclusive to the Allied side. Towards the end of the Third Reich, Minister of Propaganda Joseph Goebbels was the main force behind Operation Werewolf. Huh. The plan was to train Hitler youth members in guerrilla tactics. They would constitute a stay-behind network in charge of harassing Allied occupation armies after the inevitable fall of Berlin. Werewolf never fully achieved its objective. Special Forces officer and notable goon Otto Skorzeny took over the plan using what little network it had created to smuggle Nazi officials abroad. On the other hand, the NKVD learned about the plan and used it as a justification to execute about 5,000 Hitler Youth members, all under the age of 17. Dog! First, first of all, right, you're gonna tell me that like the Nazi rat lines that like they used to escape Germany weren't that successful and you're also gonna give like the 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 soviets shit for execute oh well you know they're under fifth 17 or 60 whatever however fucking old they were it's like dude as if they didn't commit a war crime at some point yeah well and i mean it, it also sounds like their explicit purpose was to stay behind as a uh relic of the nazi right 
the Nazi government and to harass and I assume murder right through guerrilla tactics the Soviet occupation. Sounds like that's what they were doing, right? Kind kind of seems. And they said that a, a notable goon took them over. I'm not right. sure what that meant, but and then they were executed. It's like we we get it that you're like you know anti-communist or whatever, or you're like not a big fan of the Soviet Union and shit. But like you you don't have to like hand it to the Nazis at any point, dog. Like oh, whatever. Now, at the onset of the Cold War, the Western and Soviet spheres of influence were divided along a clearly defined fault line, from Stettin to Trieste, to quote Winston Churchill. As we explored in our earlier special about Italy, this country was in a rather unique position, occupied by the Western Allies, but home to a strong Communist Party with access to both weapons and an intelligence network. A communist uprising supported by a Soviet invasion was a concrete possibility. Wait, what was the intelligence network that the Italian communists had? Well, let's see. There was an intelligence network? Last I checked, um, the Soviet Union told them, like, yo, just put your arms down, dog. We're not coming to help. Uh, well, I put it in Italian communist intelligence, and the first thing is CIA activities in Italy. <laughs> Soviet. How about that? Yeah, let's, let's try Soviet. The Soviet dimension of Italian communism. This is a JSTOR article. Um, Mikhail Suslov, a powerful member of the Politburo of the Communist Party, CPSU is CPSU during the era of Leonid Brezhnev. This is in 1967. Right. Um, hmm. I would have to log into my JSTOR to look through that, and that would probably take us a while. We'll, Italy KGB spies. We'll get back to you on this one, chat and taken very seriously by the U.S. Occupation Army. On the 14th of January 1947, Special Agent Nicholas Natsios of the U.S. CIC, the Nicholas Intelligence what? Corps, received a visit from one Giancarlo Luzzato, codenamed Scorpion. Luzzato claimed to have been an OSS informant and courier in 1944 and 1945. The Scorpion asked Natsios for details Isn't about the really RAC. Nazi? His name's Natsios. Nazios. Right. I was like, what the fuck is his name? <laughs> of which Nazios knew nothing about. According to the Italian informant, the RAC was a covert intervention group composed of elements of US. Wait, 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 wait. I'm sorry, did you say your name is Nazios? Like some kind of a hate breakfast cereal? Fucking also the RAC? Like, yeah. like rock against communism <laughs> and your name's Nazios. It sounds like an edgy kid on a fucking music fucking uh, message board right? in the early 2000s. Like, yeah, uh, you know, I'm really into RAC bands. My name is Richard Nazios. To be used in an emergency against communist revolutionary action. The report also mentions another group. The Scorpion claimed to be a member of the Italian Liberation Army, or AIL, Armata Italiana de Liberazione. At its peak, the AIL could rely on 120,000 members, mainly current or former armed forces personnel, with a nationalist, neo-fascist, oh, and anti-communist oh, okay, so, agenda. So fascist. Their aim was to stage a counter-insurrection in case of communist takeover of the country, and alongside other smaller neo-fascist groups, it enjoyed close supervision from the head of the CIC in Italy. Now, a report of the Italian police dated the 16th of September 1946 states that the members of such organizations are in constant contact with American authorities, which have confirmed their support to the movement. U.S. support to a former fascist military was not news in the autumn of 1946. Really? As early as May of the same year, the OSS had allegedly facilitated the evasion of commandos of the 10th Flotilla MAS from a POW camp in Toronto, southern Italy. The MAS were the special forces of the Royal Italian Navy, protagonists of daring raids against Allied shipping in the Second World War. 
Even as early as April 1945, the OSS had helped their commander, Prince Junio Valerio Borghese, escape capture by disguising him as an American officer. The overall intent was to maintain MAS operatives as potential anti-communist assets. These dangerous liaisons between the OSS, the CIC, and neo-fascists are well documented, although they are not conclusive proof that they constituted the first formal incarnations of the Italian Gladio. The onset of clandestine networks in other European countries is thankfully more clear-cut and allows to trace the progress of the whole operation. Since the end of 1944, the British and US governments were aligned on the importance of keeping Western Europe free of communism. Uh -huh. They considered exploiting the experience and strategies of the SOE, the Special Operations Executive, the, the to start planning clandestine networks in Western Europe. The first major operations were set up in Britain and France in 1948 and 1949. British Secret Services had created a facility in Port Moncton, Portsmouth, to train the operatives of clandestine organizations in Norway, Denmark, the Netherlands, and Belgium. Huh. At the beginning of the following year, the head of the British SIS, Sir Stuart Menzies, created Menzies. the WUCC, Western Union Clandestine Committee based in France with the aim to coordinate secret unorthodox warfare. With the creation of NATO in April of that year, the WUCC was merged into the Military Alliance and renamed the Clandestine Planning Committee. Now, despite the Stay Behind operation being an integral part of NATO, it soon expanded to include neutral countries. This came under the initiative of CIA agent William Colby, based at the agency station in Stockholm. Colby initiated the creation and training of clandestine armies in neutral Sweden and Finland, neutral? as well as NATO members Norway and Denmark. One key theatre of the Cold War was, of course, West Germany. This territory was home to its own stay-behind army, the Bund Deutscher Jugend, or BDJ, and more specifically it. its paramilitary organization, the Technische Dienst, That's the how you TD. The founder of the BDJ Technische was Dienst. Dr. Paul Luyth author of the 1980s of Health Through Vitamin C, but in the 1950s, he was interested in other pursuits. A CIA report of February 1952 <laughs> states, the BDJ is already at present one of the most potent mechanisms for political warfare purposes. In fact, it is the only mass organization through which we can carry out a wide variety of assignments by issuing direct orders. The BDJ included among its ranks. It's like the inventor of high C. It's like, make sure you get your vitamin C. But you just like rewind the tape by like 30 years. It's like, if we have to kill all of them within the country. <laughs> uh, Lenin Smash, thank you so much for the gifted sub. Neutral, like neutral Switzerland that just so happened to help Nazis escape from Germany after the Soviets arrived and also had no problem taking all of their gold. Some of it possibly ripped from the mouths of people in the Holocaust. <laughs> like, what? <clears throat> Appreciate that. Oh, that's, not, that's a shout out, whatever. Several former Wehrmacht and Waffen SS officers. One of them, Hans Otto, revealed the existence of the organization to the Frankfurt police. In the subsequent raid of BDJ premises, police found evidence that the organization had been receiving a monthly subsidy of about 50,000 US dollars from US intelligence services. Okay, that's a lot more than just the 125,000 that was yeah. on the Wikipedia. 50,000 is more than 125,000? A month? Is that what it said? A month? Yeah, it said fifty thousand a month. I didn't see the month part. So let's say like fifty. Uh, one, two, three. Can you go back? Can you just go back five seconds? That's six hundred thousand a month. Can you just I mean, go a back? Year. Yeah, yeah. Can you just bring it back? Can, you can hit the, the button. Remember, police. we talked talk about in the shit. subsequent raid of BDJ premises. Police found evidence that the organization uh, had been receiving yeah. a monthly subsidy yeah, of about fifty thousand U.S. dollars. From U.S. intelligence services. Yeah, that's six hundred thousand yeah, right. a year. Listen, one of us is always lying. <laughs> a later CIA report in April 1953 summarizes a white paper on the BDJ and the TD issued by the Western German Social Democratic Party, or SPD. 
The SPD claims that the true aims of Dr. Eloy's organization lay in domestic political goals. Really? In other words, subverting the democratic government in favor of a more authoritarian regime. No kid. Okay, we'll now go back to the beginning of our story, the speech by Italian Prime Minister Andreotti. His big reveal did not actually come out of the blue. It was spurred by an ongoing investigation, which was trying to shed light on an event that had taken place in 1972. This was the assassination by bomb of three Carbonari, Italian gendarmerie officers, on the 31st of May. The inquiry, led by Magistrate Felice Casson, identified the perpetrator as a right-wing terrorist, Vincenzo Vicinguera. According to Casson, the explosives used came from one of the Gladio weapons caches. This clearly points to a connection between the stay-behind operatives and the perpetration of criminal activities, even state-sponsored terrorism. Almost immediately after Andriotti had finished his speech, Senators from the opposition expressed their suspicions that Gladio, in the absence of an external invasion, may have been used to achieve internal policy goals. Almost the same expression used by the SPD decades prior. The implication was that Gladio was implicated in the so-called strategy of tension. This involved carrying out terror attacks, sometimes false flag attacks, to isolate extremists, especially left-wing, and consolidate central <laughs> authority. Author Daniele Ganser supports this claim in his book. Lennon, he's like, I may have had a few more by the time I and terrorism in Western Europe. The theory is disputed, however, as Ganser bases his conclusion on documents which may actually be KGB forgeries. But I feel like I'm revealing too much ahead of time. As we progress in our series on Operation Gladio, we will explore these claims and try to find the truth behind Stay Behind. Really? We hope you've enjoyed today's episode. I have not. And to Did make him say the thing about forgeries, KGB forgeries. Did he? Yeah, he just said it a second ago. Go back one more time. Ganser terrorism in Western Europe. Book go. Central Authority. There you go. There you go. Author Daniele Ganser supports this claim in his book, NATO's Secret Armies, Operation Gladio, and Terrorism in Western Europe. The theory is disputed, however as Ganser bases his conclusion on documents which may actually be KGB forgeries. But I feel like I'm revealing too much ahead of time. As we progress in our series- We're going to talk about that, uh, that specific document and if it is a forgery or not. Um, so if we go forward here, that, that's going to come up. So I want everybody to remember that, that there's this book by Daniel Ganser. It's like one of like a very famous book about Gladio that makes the assertion that there's these stay behind armies and that they're utilized for domestic terrorism, like not just as a defensive force in case of a Soviet invasion. And I think we've already proven that in the case of um, Germany, if that BDJ had lists of just social Democrats and mayors to murder, that sounds like domestic terrorism as far as I understand it. That, um, yeah. But let's move forward. We're going to get to that actual document and we're going to talk more about Italy also. What about him confuses you, Kay? So we're done with this video, by the way, right? Yeah. Right. And next. Nope. Next. This is the document. Um, so U.S. Army Field Manual 3031B is a document claiming to be classified appendings to a U.S. Army Field Manual that describes top secret counterinsurgency counter tactics. In particular, it defines a strategy of tension involving violent attacks, which are then blamed on radical left-wing groups in order to convince allied governments for the need for counteraction. It has been called the Westmoreland Field Manual because it is signed with the alleged signature of General William Westmoreland. It was labeled as Supplement B, hence 3031B, although the pub publicly released version of FM 3031 is only one appendix, Supplement A. The first mention of the document was in the Turkish newspaper Baris, sometimes anglicized to Barish, in, in 1975. Uh, Fashmil, is that a Fashmil copy of FM 3031B that appeared a year later in Bangkok and various capitals of North African states? In 1978, it appeared in the various European magazines, including the Spanish uh, Triunfo and El País. The Italian press picked up the Triunfo publication, and a copy was published in an October 1978 issue of El Europo. 
A wide range of field manuals, including 31, 30, 30, 31, can be accessed through websites that catalog U.S. field manuals. However, 3031B is not among the field manuals published by the military. The Westmoreland Field Manual has was mentioned in at least two paramilitary commission reports of European countries, one about the Italian Italian Propaganda du Masonic Lodge, and one about the Belgian Stay Behind Network. The latter says that the commission has not any certainty about the authenticity of the document. Right. So go forward one. So now there's a part of this that talks about the authenticity. At a 1980 hearing of the House of Representatives, Permanent Select Committee on Intelligence, Subcommittee of Oversight, CIA officials testified that the document was a singularly effective forgery of the KGB and an example of Soviet covert action. Um, scholars Pierre Henrik Hansen and Thomas Ridd, both specializing in Cold War intelligence, and the U.S. De State Department claimed the document is a forgery by Soviet intelligence services. The document first appeared in Turkey in the 1970s before being circulated to other countries. It was also used at the end of the 70s during Operation Gladio to implicate the CIA in the Red Brigade's kidnapping and assassination of former Italian Prime Minister Aldo Moro. The discovery in the early 1990s of Operation Gladio, NATO stay behind networks in Europe, led to a renewed debate as to whether or not the manual was fraudulent. In Alan Frankovic's three-part BBC documentary on the subject, uh, Licio Gelli, the Italian leader of the anti-communist P2 Freemason Lodge, stated, the CIA gave it to me in the documentary. And Ray S. Klein said, I suspect that is an authentic document. But former CIA head William Colby said, I have never heard of it. So the, CIA, um, the, 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 the evidence that implicates the CIA from the CIA head is like, never heard of it. Doesn't look like anything to me. Well, the Ray S. Klein... Um, uh, is uh, an official at the United States Central Intelligence Agency and is best known for being chief CIA analyst during the Cuban Missile Crisis. So he said that he suspects it's an authentic document. Um, right. But there's, you know, I, I'm not completely convinced. You know what I mean? Like, I'm open to this potentially not being uh, authentic. Um, you like know, the, it seems that there's a, let me see. So it, uh, according to Licio Gelli, who is a person who is extremely implicated in this whole situation, he said that the CIA gave it to him in right. a, what was that? In like a, in like a docu BBC documentary. Yeah. And then Ray S. Klein suspects it's an authentic document, but that's a suspicion, not a, a concrete, um, and then you have other people saying that it is, I read somewhere else that there was potentially uh ex-soviet kgb who testified that it was fraudulent um but i don't have that in front of me so just keep that in mind as we move forward here the gladio story broke in italy in the fall of 1990 stemming from a judicial investigation into a 1972 car bombing which discovered that the explosives had come from one of the 139 secret weapons depots kept for gladio's forces in italy subsequently the head of the Italian parliamentary inquiry into the matter revealed that when Gladio was started, the Americans would often insist that the organization also had to be used to counter any insurgencies. Retired Greek general Nikos Kouris told a similar story, declaring that a Greek force was formed with CIA help in 1955 to intervene in the case of communistic threat. Whether external or internal, these were ex-military men, specifically trained soldiers and also civilians. What held them together was one ideological common denominator: extreme rightism. Hmm. What? What else? What other uh, kind of political ideology could be characterized as extreme rightism? I wonder. So this is that car bombing that we talked about a second ago, and also this individual was in that documentary. This is where you know, if we are to believe this, you know, kind of Gladio situation this is where the everything starts to unravel so vincenzo vinciguerra uh, is an italian neo-fascist activist a former member of the national vanguard and new order which are both nazi organizations uh he is currently serving a life sentence for the murder of three caber Benari by a car bomb in Paetano in 1972 and the investigation in this previously unsolved affair by prosecutor felice case and led to the revelation of gladio networks around western europe um carabinieri okay gotcha sorry Greg Lox. Is that, <laughs> do i sound better now a little bit okay um the 1972 pediano bombing 
Uh, following juridical investigations, it has been discovered that, this, that C4 explosives, the most powerful explosives available at the time, used in the 1972 bombing came from a Gladio arms dump located beneath a cemetery near Verona, whose existence was revealed to judges Felice Quezon and Carlo Mastelloni by Giulio Andriotti, former Prime Minister of Italy. Judge Kazan's investigations revealed that Marco Morin, an explosive expert who worked for the Italian police and member of Ord uh, the New Order, which is a Nazi organization, a uh, far-right group, had deliberately provided a fake expertise claiming that the explosive used were the same that the Red Brigades used, who is obviously the communists in Italy. However, Kazan demonstrated that the explosives were in fact C4, which was used by NATO. Uh, a group of carabinieri had accidentally discovered on February 24th, 1972, an arms dump near Trieste containing arms, munitions, and C4 identical to the one used in Pe Pediano the same year. Oh, uh, Quaker Oats guy. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, identical to the, C to the one used in Pediano the same year. According to historian Daniel Ganser, who is the one who is under scrutiny, he's the historian that wrote a very famous book about this, but he relied very heavy on that Westmoreland document. And if that document were to be proven fraudulent, that a lot of his theories would probably fall apart. But actually, I'm not so sure about that because that's, I think, what I'm intended on doing is that let's just say we took that document out of the mix. Right. Let's say that that document never existed. Right. Um, if we can establish that the BDJ had a bunch of lists of social Democrats and mayors to murder on CIA payroll. Right. Does it matter if that, if that document was fraudulent or not? Right. The fact that like they we were all either, or I'm sorry, not all, a majority of them were like, you know, Waffen SS, you know, or Wehrmacht. Exactly. Right. Exactly. Like, is that well, not like, I believe here, and I'm just trying to, pl I'm, I'm doing it both sides. Um, both what sides. I believe here, the contention is, is that no one contends that there was not a Gladio. Right. No one intent. No one contends that there was not stay behind armies. Right. But that I were that were composed of formerly fascist. Forces. I don't think that that's the controversial part either. I think that that's also widely accepted. I think what the controversy is is were they being used for domestic terrorism? I think that's the part that is being uh, contested by a lot of people. Yes. Well, I, I think I mean, that we can clearly demonstrate like, that in <laughs> Germany. Now let's look at Italy. So if we believe this explosive expert who says that this is not the type of cheap explosives that were used by the Red Brigades, this right. was a this was a um, C4, which is used by NATO, and we discovered a cache of weapons that was supplied by NATO, um, you, and they match for this. So Daniel Ganser writes in his book, Kassin's investigation revealed that the right-wing organization Ordine Nuovo had collaborated very closely with the Italian military secret service. Together, they had engineered the Pediano terror and then wrongly blamed the militant extreme Italian left, the Red Brigades. Judge Kassin identified New Order member Vincent, Vincenzo Vinciguerra as the man who had planted the Pediano bomb. He confessed and testified that he had been covered by an entire network of sympathizers in Italy and abroad who had ensured that after the attack he could escape. A whole mechanism came into action, he said. That is called the Carabinieri. The Minister of the Interior, the Customs Services, and the Military and Civilian Intelligence accepted the ideological reasoning behind the attacks. According to him, in 1969, Plaza Fontana bombing oh, was... Sorry. ...was supposed to push the Interior Minister Francesco Restivo to declare a state of emergency. So also, here's another uh, piece of evidence. If we do are to believe the testimony of Vincenzo, he is also saying that he was part, that the the ideological reasoning behind the attacks was accepted by intelligence services. So he's also stating that this was. So I think that's another piece of evidence towards that they were being utilized for domestic terrorism. Right. And... Um the the carabinieri that's kind of like the military police or not military police it's like a sort of uh, militarized police force within the country so okay. when, when he keeps talking about the carabinieri mm -hmm. all right so continuing with this guy vincenzo 
Here's another act of terrorism that happened eight years later. The the Bologna, the Bologna massacre. Is this the Bologna massacre? The Bologna. Bologna massacre. Got it. Right. Uh, in eight, 1984, questioned by judges about the 1980 Bologna station bomb, Vince Aguirre said, with the massacre of Petana, Petiano, and with all those that have followed, the knowledge should by now be clear that there existed a real live structure occult and hidden with the capacity of giving a strategic direction to the outrages. It lies within the state itself. There exists in Italy a secret force parallel to the armed forces composed of civilians and military men in anti-Soviet capacity. That is to organize a resistance on Italian soil against a Russian army, a secret organization, a super organization with a network of communications, arms and explosives and men trained to use them. A super organization which, lacking a Soviet, Soviet military invasion, which might not happen, took up the task on NATO's behalf of preventing a slip to the left in the political balance of the country. I thought I was going to say the political banana of the country, like a slip to the left on the political banana. Jesus Christ. Uh, this they did with the assistance of the official secret services and the polit political and military forces. Uh, Vince Guerra explained how the Italian secret services had protected him, helping him flying away to Franco with Spain. Huh. According to Ganser, Gladio stopped protecting Vince Guerra as soon as he started talking, which permitted his subsequent trial. Huh. Um, lastly, he has allegations concerning NATO. Uh, Vince Guerra also made the statement to The Guardian. The terrorist line was followed by camouflaged people, people belonging to the security apparatus or those linked to the state apparatus through rapport or collaboration. I say that every single outrage that followed him from 69 fitted into a single organized matrix. Um, the Vanguard and the New Order, the main right-wing terrorist group active in the 1970s, were being mobilized into the battle as part of an anti-communist strategy originating not within organizations deviant from the institutions of power, but from within the state itself. And specifically, from, from, within, the, we're, we're, from within the ambit armpit and of the state relations with the atlantic alliance which i assume means nato atlantic right. alliance yeah. um he also appeared and made similar allegations in a bbc documentary on gladio so obviously this individual's testimony do you know what this kind of reminds me of go ahead do you remember uh when we were doing italy before this and you yep. brought up that one guy that said that allegedly uh right. somebody from the u.s tried it to like kind of uh, sequester, uh, uh, um, what the fuck's his name? Fucking Mussolini, right before he was murdered. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, I <laughs> kind of tracks. Well, you know? Also, what this reminds you? Do you remember that bandit that that shot to death a bunch of uh, yes. communist protesters on May Day? Yes. And he was real. Like as he was getting arrested, he was like, "There's shit bigger than me that is behind all this." Yes. But he was also, you know, it was kind of like his testimony that alluded to many things. So that's what it kind of reminded me—a very Italian situation here. Very Italian situation. Not to mention, I think that like it shouldn't be overlooked. Like you know. What would happen if Italy were to go red? Like, even if it, even if it was like you know not like entirely linked up with like the Soviet Union, chances are the relations would improve, right? And then like well, the the, Soviet... the thing was, let's not even talk about the Soviet Union. Let's talk about Greece and Yugoslavia. Greece, Yugoslavia. These are the places that would consolidate right. a whole different block, right? You know what I mean? The like, not aligned like a, block. A, exactly. Like you know what I mean? Like, and then also. You know, then what happens when China and Vietnam and Korea happen? Well, now you have like they've, half they've got the a fucking huge world. port right into the now you have like a half a fucking world. And then let's say Nasser is able to accomplish what he needs to accomplish. Mm -hmm. Let's say that Sik uh, not Sicardo, Nkrumah and Lumumba are never toppled. And you have you know, uh, well, I mean, you know, if, if they don't have every if they don't have Italy, they can't even get to Syria. They can't even get to uh, fucking oh, Nasser. Right. They, I was they, about to say, do you remember all that shit that we were reading in the Middle East? Yeah, where all the those those fleets came from italy they all came from italy mm -hmm. so it's like they no longer have that port in the mediterranean to even fuck with all the anti-colonial shit that's yeah. going on and like you know it, it shouldn't even be the middle east it's literally just like you know the the fucking western atlantic the western mediterranean or whatever but like you know suddenly like you know you have this whole block of non-aligned countries that now have a giant port country like italy mm -hmm. i don't know i i yeah. think i 
I don't think it's a forgery. And I think even if it is a forgery, I don't think it's wrong. What do you have to say that it's not a forgery though? Just your vibes? I, I Kind of vibes, I'm not gonna lie. Uh, I am kind of going off of vibes. The thing, we don't even need to make it. Uh, there's people that say it is, people that say it isn't. Let's just remove it from the equation right. and see if we can establish strong enough evidence that this is being carried out. This I way. mean, we have a, a, what would you call it? Like um, a, uh, a behavior, like a, 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 a systematic behavior that the CIA is exhibiting throughout this period in all of these different countries. Like what is so like, you know, uh, demonstrably different right from what they're doing in all these other countries that like they wouldn't have this kind of apparatus in italy are you asking me if they wouldn't would or wouldn't have this apparatus or are you asking me if the document is fraudulent or not oh, if, if they wouldn't have the apparatus like well if the document is a forgery or not it really doesn't matter like do you think that like it's impossible or implausible well that... i think that i made this these slides with the specific intention of spelling <laughs> out an amount of evidence that says that 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 would prove this if that fucking document was real or not and, and you I did think a good that job. i may have constructed these slides to give us these exact <laughs> things to talk about <laughs> So, yes, Wilco, there's a, a precedence here, you know. Here's uh, Vincenzo talking, and I'm going to go pee real quick. All right. Italiano è stato un atto di guerra, motivato da una ragione molto semplice. è stato un atto di guerra motivato da una ragione molto semplice i corpi di polizia i servizi di sicurezza chat tell me can you read these subtitles here do i need to have like the 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 auto translate subtitles he's not speaking my native tongue i don't speak italian I just need one person to tell me I can read those subtitles. I don't need the auto translate subtitles. Okay. Le forze politiche che usufruiscono dei servizi e di queste forze di polizia hanno strumentalizzato il mio fascismo italiano. Lo hanno strumentalizzato fin dai primordi, fin dal 1945-46. Petiano nasce come un atto di rivolta con un segnale di rivolta contro questa strumentalizzazione, colpendo l'arma più rappresentativa dello Stato. On May the 31st, 1972, the Carabinieri in Petiano received a phone call. Aspetta, vorrei dirle che c'è la, che la fe, una, una macchina che ha due buchi eh, sul, sul parabrezza, no? Fra la strada del Pozzo Terfarmata a Savogna. Three policemen were lured to a car primed to explode. All three were to die. The destra non si poteva e non si doveva attaccare lo Stato e chi lo Stato rappresentava. Bisognava attaccare i civili, quello che è il popolo, le donne, i bambini, le persone innocenti e strane ad ogni gioco politico. Per una ragione semplice, perché bisognava obbligare questa gente, l'opinione pubblica italiana, a rivolgersi allo Stato, a rivolgersi al regime per chiedere maggiore sicurezza. Il ruolo della destra d'Italia è stato proprio questo. Si è messo a servizio di apparati di Stato che hanno alimentato una strategia che giustamente è stata definita dalla tensione Hmm, sounds familiar. Quando bisognava portare la gente ad accettare in qualsiasi momento, nell'arco di un trentennio dal 1960, la possibilità di uno stato di emergenza. Quindi la gente avrebbe barattato molto volentieri parte della sua libertà con una sicurezza 
con la sicurezza di poter camminare sulle strade, viaggiare sui treni, salire sugli aerei, entrare in banca. Questa è la logica politica che sta dietro tutte le stragi, che rimangono impunite proprio perché lo Stato non può condannare se stesso o proclamare se stesso un colpevole di quello che ha fatto. Oggi di nuovo si ritrova in tutto, ma mai in una battaglia ideologica propria. Si proclama nazionalsocialista, ma in realtà il suo capo, Pino Raut, ha lavorato per lo Stato Maggiore delle Forze Armate Nate della Resistenza, è stato un esperto del SED e ha reclutato uomini per queste strutture parallele. Hmm. Uh, why does that sound and feel so familiar? That, like, what he said? Yeah, that like, you know, uh, just a series of attacks, but never on police, and it's always like innocent people, and then like, you know, the police kind of always say that like, oh, they were on our radar, et cetera, et cetera, right? And that, mm -hmm. like, you know, we have uh, one part of, like, the political apparatus talking about how we need to remove firearms, right, from mm. the public and how, like, you know, it's always, like, the, the leftists, right, that are actually the problem. <sighs> oh, no, you're good. The boy in. Why have we seen this? Where, have we seen this playbook before? Sounds kind of, uh, kind of familiar, don't you think? As in Germany, see Germany chapter, the Italian operation was closely tied to terrorists. A former Gladio agent, Roberto uh, Cavallero, went public to charge that there was a direct link between Gladio and Italy's wave of terrorist bombings in the 1970s and early 1980s, which left at least 300 dead. He said that Gladio had trained him and many others to prepare groups which, in the event of an advance by left-wing forces in our country, would fill the streets, creating a situation of such tension as to require military intervention. Cavallero was, one, was of course referring to the electoral advances of the Italian Communist Party, not an invasion by the Soviet Union. The single worst terrorist action was the bombing at the Bologna railway station in August 1980, which claimed 86 lives. The Observer of London reported, The Italian railway bombings were blamed on the extreme left as part of a strategy to convince voters that the country was in a state of tension and that they had no alternative to voting the, no alternative to voting the safe Christian democratic ticket. All clues point to the fact that they were masterminded from within Gladio. Right. Well, that's what I'm, I'm saying, Ross, is that, like, it kind of seems like any political movement that poses a threat to capital is unreasonable, right? Well, and also, this is from a New York Times article, this Robert Cav Cavallero guy, um, yeah. you know, that says that there is a direct link. So, hold on, let me see right here. So... I, I didn't put this in just because I thought it a bit weird. But if you want to pull this up real quick. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Just, Alfred, just look at those two pictures and tell me they don't kind of look alike. <laughs> <laughs> okay, yeah, yeah. They, they look alike. You heard it here. So just type in Robert Caravallo or whatever that is. Just type in Robert on the control F real quick. Okay. We don't have to read through all of it. All I right. just want to. Robert. Oh, Roberto Cavallero. Sorry. Oh, yeah. No, Meanwhile, right. details have emerged of the role played by civilians in the secret sorry, operation. Sorry, sorry, sorry. I just need to make it bigger. Otherwise, chat can't fucking see what you're reading. Um, meanwhile, details have emerged of a role played by civilians in the secret operation. One of them, Verona businessman Roberto Cavallero, told the Italian newspaper El Espresso <laughs> that he was recruited after taking part in anti-Soviet demonstrations in the event of a communist takeover. His task would have been to cause as much civil unrest as possible, Cavallero said. Cavallero described how he was paid 700,000 lire. Lire. Is that what they need in Italy? Yes, lire. 
each month, which was handed him in a yellow envelope by one of the two intelligence officials who had recruited him. He left the organization in 73. He said after he heard of a plot to murder two former communists, one male, one female, the plan was later abandoned. Thank you, Chimera this Machida. Another, this seems to be a... Uh, oh, thank you so much for the sub. Um, this is another instance here, it appears, of an individual publicly stating that he was not only being trained in case of a soviet military incursion but being trained to cause civil unrest and to murder communists all right i i feel <laughs> like the the like kind of run-of-the-mill person that's roped into this bullshit right is told yeah. like oh this is just in case like the soviet union decides to invade because you know propaganda and a lot of people in the West thinking that, like, any day now, any day yeah. those fucking T-34s are going to come barreling down the fucking countryside and they're going to take over everything. But, like, for the people that were, like, in the know, like, I feel like the kind of further up you went in rank or in terms of organization of this, they were, like, more aware that, like, mm, no, they're probably not coming. This is more so just to prevent, like, any kind of, like, left-wing leadership from taking rise within the country. Yeah, exactly. I agree. And, you know, I don't know. It, for me, this is all very disturbingly similar to a lot of what we've seen happen over the last, like, 20 years. Ar arguably, definitely within the last 10, but, like, you know, with the amount of shootings happening every day, like, with the rise of, like, you know, right-wing paramilitary groups um with like you know the the infiltration of uh our military and police forces by these right-wing paramilitary groups to an unknown degree it just yeah. it's this so, is about the baloney station bombing we don't have to watch the whole thing because the second half of it is just about like current day memorials and stuff like that it's not super necessary but the, the beginning is good okay This is one of the worst bombings in European history. Oh, I imagine that's outside of like, war bombing. I'm sorry, could you repeat that? I said I would imagine that's outside of like war bombing. Right. But like terrorist bombings. Ipotesi fatte fin da stamane erano in sostanza tre, cioè scoppio, eh, scoppio di, di bombole, scoppio della caldaia eh. della centrale termica che è sotto la, 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 la seconda classe, esatto. della ferrovia. C'era il rifiuto psicologico di accettare l'idea dell'attentato, perché Bologna è stata sempre una città abbastanza tranquilla, dove eh, la gente è vissuta tranquilla e di questi, di questi casi. Io sono sopravvissuta. I miei genitori saprebbero forse spiegare cosa ha significato. Io sono stata fortunata, mi dicono. Credo di esserlo stata. Ed è così che posso dire di avere una dipendenza. Una dipendenza al bisogno di aiuto. Perché dovresti fare appello alle certezze e alle sicurezze che ognuna ha dentro di sé, ma che io non ho più. Oggi in questa testimonianza scelgo, scelgo di non apparire perché allora non ho potuto scegliere mio malgrado di diventare il simbolo di una strage di così grande portata e ogni volta che mi rivedo rivivo la mia paura, il mio sconcerto. Io vorrei poter voltare pagina e trovare la serenità e le certezze che avevo prima di rimanere sepolto in quel cumulo di macerie, ma per questo ci vorrebbe anche che chi ha ideato e compiuto la strage si assuma le proprie responsabilità.
Because they're still unknown in this video. You can stop it now. This is where they start doing it every year, how they remember it. And right. Just some good footage and information about the attack itself there to spice up the conversation. Um, let's see here. What is next? One of the men sought for questioning in Italy about the baloney bombing. Roberto Fior has lived in London ever since, and the British government has refused to extradite him. He is apparently under the protective wing of M16, Britain's CIA, for whom he has provided valuable intelligence. The kidnapping and murder of 1978 of the kidnapping and murder in 1978 of Aldo Moro. This is where things get real crazy. The leader of the Christian Democrats, which was attributed to the Red Brigade, appears now to have also been the work of Gladio agents, provocateurs, who infiltrated the organization just prior to his abduction. Mor Moro had announced his intention to enter into a governmental coalition with the Communist Party. Um, let's move forward. I think I have something here. Okay, so let's check this out real quick. Is that Walter motherfucking Cronkite? <laughs> Italian political leader and former premier Aldo Moro was Aldo kidnapped Moro. on a Rome street today. The most brazen terrorist attack by the extremist Red Brigade since they began their reign of terror in Italy eight years ago. We have reports from Bob McNamara and Winston Burdett. It happened along a quiet Rome residential street. The attackers had staged an auto accident to block the path of both Moro's car and that of his bodyguards. The terrorists sprayed submachine gun and pistol fire into the cars, killing the five bodyguards. Witnesses said Moro was dragged by the terrorists to a waiting getaway car. Rome police believe at least six and perhaps as many as 12 terrorists were involved in this well-planned and executed attack. The kidnapping of one of Italy's most prominent political leaders brought thousands of police into the streets. Roadblocks were set up and police carried out searches and identity checks across the city. The terrorists identified themselves as the urban guerrillas, the self-styled Red Brigades, and they demanded freedom for 15 of their members now on trial in Turin, charged with kidnappings and other terrorist activities. Aldo Moro was Italian premier five times. He has long been head of the Christian Democrats, the country's leading political party. Moro was expected to be elected Italy's next president. Moro's kidnapping shook the Italian government and caused an uproar in the Chamber of Deputies. Premier Giulio Andreotti called an emergency cabinet session and later went before both houses of parliament to seek and win a vote of confidence for his new government, a government that Moro had helped to create. Today, Pope Paul VI joined political leaders in denouncing the Moro kidnapping. And also, after learning of the attack, all political parties across Italy staged demonstrations in the country's major cities. The communist-dominated trade union federation called a 24-hour general strike to protest the terrorist attack. The demonstrations brought a rare sight to Italian politics as communists and Christian Democrats met in the streets to express their concern for the life of Aldo Moro, who's thought to be held prisoner somewhere in Rome tonight. Bob McNamara, CBS News, Rome. Italy's Red Brigades are a group of self-styled revolutionaries whose one weapon is terror, murder, kidnapping, assault, robbery. Their avowed leader and 14 of their members are now being tried in Turin chained together in a courtroom cage, charged with subverting the Italian state. That is their declared aim. Their only ideology is destruction, to subvert, to overwhelm the Italian state by engulfing it in a wave of terror. They have been active for eight years. Most of them students or ex-students now in their mid-twenties. Last month, they machine gunned to death in Rome the prison inspector who had supervised security arrangements for the present trial. This was his funeral. Six days ago, the day after the trial opened, they murdered a high official of the anti-terrorist brigade in Turin. This was his funeral. Today's kidnapping of Aldo Moro, the ambush of his car, the surprise attack, the timing, the immediate machine gun killing of all five men of Morrow's guard and the successful getaway all showed minute planning, savage proficiency, the possession of an ample arsenal and large financial means. It was the latest mm. brutal act in a long and unbroken Large chain. financial means, you said. Winston Burdett, CBS News, Rome. So, there's a news report 
of uh, Aldo Moro's kidnapping at the hands of the Red Brigade, which are communists in Italy. If you go forward one slide, please. Oh, oh, there this, you go. Yeah, I this mean, is a pretty well-known picture of uh, Brigate Rosa um, flag behind Aldo Moro. I think this is like the last known picture of him alive. Yep, yeah, that's uh, that. I guess we can end the stream here, right? <laughs> Would you? I mean, this is pretty clear what happened, right? Uh, chat, is it? Is it clear? I don't particularly see how or why anyone. Yep, clap. Everybody clap because we're going to wrap it up here. Um, That's at the end. El fin. I don't know. Just click it one more time. See if there's anything else. <laughs> Wait a second. Wait Hold a on. second. Wait, just, 2005. I thought this was happening in the 70s. <laughs> what? What? Sergio Flamingi, Flamigni, a leftist politician and writer who had served on a paramilitary inquiry on the Moro case, suggested the involvement of the Operation Gladio network directed by NATO. He asserted that Gladio had manipulated Moretti as a way to take over the uh, Red Brigade to effect a strategy of tension aimed at creating popular demand for a new right-wing law and order regime. But wait, there's in, more! <laughs> in, to, in 2006, uh, Steve Piekzenik was interviewed by Emmanuel Amara in his documentary film Les Derniers Jours Le Dernier Jour Aldo Moro. The Last Days. Um, With French, you just got to say the first and last letter and everything in between yeah. is this. Uh. In the interview, Yek Zinek, an expert on international terrorism and negotiating strategies who had been brought to Italy as a consultant to Interior Minister Francesco Casigna's crisis committee stated that we had to sacrifice Aldo Moro to maintain the stability of Italy. Uh, PX Zenic maintained that the U.S. had to instrumentalize the Red Brigades. According to him, the decision to have Moro killed was taken during the fourth week of his detention when Moro was thought to be revealing state secrets in his letters. Namely, the existence of Gladio. Oh. In, in another interview, Casiga, the former interior minister, revealed that the crisis committee had leaked a false statement attributed to the Red Brigades that Mora was already dead. This was introduced to communicate to the kidnappers that further neg negotiations would be useless since the government had written Moro off. Huh. So. Huh. There's all that. In Belgium, in 1983, to convince the public that a security crisis existed, Gladio operatives, as well as police officers, staged a series of seemingly random shootings in supermarkets, which, whether intended or not, led to several deaths. Huh. A year later, a party of U.S. Marines parachuted into Belgium with the intention of attacking a police station. One Belgian citizen was killed, and one of the Marines lost an eye in the operation. I think it might have been friendly fire. Uh, that was intended to jolt the local Belgian police into a higher state of alert and to give the impression to the comfortable population at large that the country was on the brink of red revolution. Guns used in the operation were later planted in a Brussels house used by a communist splinter group. As late as 1990, large stockpiles of weapons and explosives for Operation Gladio could still be found in some member countries. And Italian Prime Minister Giulio Andriotti disclosed that more than 600 people still remained in the Gladio payroll in Italy. So go forward. I really tried to find stuff about this situation in Belgium. Um, so this is called the Brabant Killers. Uh, it's also named the Nijville Gang in Dutch-speaking media, uh, and the Mad Killers of Brabant in the French-speaking media. media. Um, they are responsible for a series of violent attacks that mainly occurred in the Belgian province of Brabant between 82 and 85. A total of 28 people died and 22 were injured. The actions of the gang, believed to consist of a core of three men, made it Belgium's most notorious unsolved crime spree. The active participants were known as the Giant, the Killer, and the old man. Are you fucking kidding? What is this? Metal Gear Solid? What the fuck are these goddamn names? The identities and whereabouts of the Brabant killers are unknown. Although significant resources are still dedicated to the case, the most recent arrests are of the now retired original senior detectives themselves for alleged evidence tampering. Um, 
Fuck's sake. The gang abruptly seized their activities in 1985. The ensuing chaotic investigation failed to catch them or even make serious inroads to solving the case. This led to a paramilitary inquiry and public discussion, both of which revolved around the possibility that the gang members were Belgian or foreign state security elements either carrying out covert missions, disguised targeted assassinations, or conducting political terrorism. Go forward. Snack! So now there's this, which is the uh, official complicity. Certain events surrounding the robbery of the Del Hayes supermarket in Alst on 9 November 85 served to further strengthen media-fueled rumors of a connection between the gang and elements of the Belgian military and the Belgian gender army in particular. For example, the supermarket was hit despite patrols passing at every 20 minutes and gender arms close to the scene did not engage or pursue the robbers, although no such connection has been officially proven. The lack of satisfactory performance in the Brabant killer's case was among the reasons for the subsequent abolishing of the Belgian gender army. A connection with the clandestine stay-behind network SDRA-8, Operation Gladio, has also been suggested. However, an official parliamentary inquiry found no substantive evidence that the network was involved in any terrorist acts or that the criminal groups had infiltrated it. Right. I suppose the connection between the Brabant Killers, Gladio, and by then defunct Belgian far-right organization, the Westland New Post, led by Paul Latinus, is mentioned in the 1992 BBC Time Watch documentary series Operation Gladio, directed by Alan Frankovich, in which it suggested that Latinus said that his organization was sanctioned by the Belgian government. Hmm. So that's the information that I have for that. It kind that's of, the end. Th- there's kind of like a pattern here of like, you know, the people when they're caught and when they're like fessing up to shit are like, the CIA gave this to me. The state sanctioned this. The state paid us. The CIA paid us, right? And then the CIA or the state government being like, that didn't happen. They have no evidence. The CIA denying it. Is, am, am I wrong? Uh, there's more than just a denouncement from the CIA. You know what I mean? Yeah. Because, because, you know, this is a parliamentary investigation, which is a little bit different than like, you know, you, you, you know, there may be like, you know what I mean? A lot of times the CIA is operating outside of the purview of Congress on many things. Like, even if you look at stuff that, um, Ronald Reagan was doing in South America, the reason Iran Contra was so egregious is because it violated the Boland amendment because the Boland amendment was them being like, you have to stop fucking around in South America. Like there was people in Congress that were like, you need to stop doing this in South America. This has got to stop. It's, it's, exactly. de- it's destabilizing the entire it's, continent. Exactly. So it's not like every sector of the government was complicit in what the CIA was doing in Nicaragua. Right. Um, the State Department was. So right. I don't know what the tiers of Belgian civil society is. Um, but they're saying here that uh, official parliamentary inquiry found no substantive el- evidence. I mean, I guess then we would have to start figuring out how legitimate is that investigative body, right? Um, which is far more uh, strenuous than the energy that I have to put into this specific thing. I don't blame. That's you. why I just put this whole thing here. There's all the evidence for one way or the other. You can, you can do what you will with it. I just, <laughs> I just personally wouldn't want to put one thing on there that's from the book. Uh huh. With, if I notice that there's a bunch of other evidence that says that it might not be true, right. and I just ignore it. Because this book was written in the 90s. Right. Like, you know what I mean? Like, when, when we were reading that one part, I forget what it was about, but it was all based on one guy's book that has never been corroborated and sources uh, Operation have never been revealed. Splinter Factor or whatever. Yeah. I didn't want to just shove that into here and tell everybody about it and be like, there you go. I wanted to put the addendum on there that like, hey, there is a book written about this where this guy claims to know all these things, but just take it with a grain of salt. Right. So like... You know, I like putting out a number of things. Some of these are more conclusive than others. Right. So, like, again, chat, like, at the end of the day, that like, yes, but most of the opinions you can tell when they're mine or Pat's, right? But for the most part, uh, we like to give you the book, and then we also like to give you the book with just, like, a little bit more, you know, uh, not I, w- I wouldn't even call it research, but just, like, investigating it just a little bit, right? And that's why we always go into, like, the Wikipedias. That's why Pat right. is always referencing other complimentary books, you know, on the subject and topics that he's read. Benny once made a video about the CIA going against the law and operating without Congress's full knowledge, and she got backlash. Pull up the Boland Amendment for me. You got it. Johnny, Boland Amendment. 
pull it up. <laughs> so yeah, Sebs, just look at this. I mean, it's. <laughs> So yeah, you can see right here that this was a term describing two U.S. legislative amendments between 82 and 84, both aimed at limiting U.S. government assistance to the Contras in Nicaragua. The first Boland Amendment was part of the House Appropriations Bill of 82, which was attached as a rider to the Fence Appropriations Bills of 83, blah, blah, blah. House of Representatives passed it. Um, December 82, it was signed by Ronald Reagan. Mm -hmm. The amendment outlawed U.S. assistance to the Contras for the purpose of overthrowing the Nicaraguan government while allowing assistance for other purposes. So that was the thing. Beyond restricting covert U.S. support for the Contras, the most significant effect of the amendment was the Iran-Contra affair during the Reagan administration circumvented the amendment in order to continue supplying arms to the Contra. So this is, like, I had to do, I did a research paper on Iran-Contra um, right. in one of my history classes. And this is one of the things that I learned of, is that a lot of what was going on between North and Poindexter and Reagan and these people, Congress did not know about this. And there's a lot of people, Congress took measures to stop them from doing this. Oh, it, so like, it, it is incredibly illegal, Ross. <laughs> well, what's even more illegal is, illegal is that they were trading, uh, they were selling missiles to Iran, who was a country that we were like in. So Reagan got into office by essentially being like, those fucking Iranians took our people hostage mm -hmm. and that piss pants Jimmy Carter couldn't do shit about it. And I stepped my big dick into office and they let those hostages go. And right now I'm currently supporting Saddam Hussein in his disgusting war against the Iranian people, but also I'm selling them missiles on the side. Like right. this I'm was also, like almost I'm, more. He also created a deal with them, if I'm not mistaken, where it's just like, don't release the hostages until after I'm elected. Right. Yeah. I've heard of that too, but I'm just saying more so is like what it meant for Ronald Reagan to be selling, um, missiles to right. a country that was like on like an official terrorist watch list at that point yes. like that's even worse because at least with nicaragua nicaragua was just part of the course what the united states already believed that there's a bunch of crazy communist death squads down there that we need to assist the people with like that's right um that the the u.s public would have swallowed that just fine what they wouldn't swallow are those terrifying iranian terrorists who were just holding our people hostage a few years earlier mm -hmm. you're telling me ronnie reagan the guy who released the hostages is now selling them missiles and he like, worked a deal with them to yeah. not release the hostages you mean they could have been set free even sooner he kept americans in hostage in danger uh-huh for, for political gain yeah <laughs> so it's kind of like <laughs> Fucking, um, it's kind of like, uh, what the fuck is it? The Azov Battalion, right? When, like, you know, it started to become more of a story that, like, we're funding Ukrainian neo-Nazis and their paramilitary, like, you know, training camps. There's a number of people in Congress that were, like, alarmed by it, right? So we made a bill and it got passed not to fund the Azov Battalion anymore. So what does the Ukrainian government do? It absorbs them directly into their military <laughs> and we just keep sending money and arms to the ukrainian military so you know i don't know why uh benny would have gotten any backlash for saying that like it's kind of ridiculous to assume that the entire the entirety of the u.s government is you know um what am I looking for? Uh, implicit in the foreign affairs and right. the clandestine operations. You know, the State Department r r frequently works under the nose yeah. of... Um, <laughs> your, your your average congressman doesn't know how their fucking Wi-Fi works, let yeah. alone what the fucking CIA is doing yeah. on a day-to-day -day basis. Well, and even, um, and even Ronald Reagan during Iran-Contra was almost had such a shroud of um plausible deniability around the old thing that he he he, he was able to kind of get out of it I, by being like i don't Oliver know north and poindexter were rogue agents i had no idea what the fuck I, they were doing I, they, they, they did that behind my back I believe, I believe they testified to that in congress and who knows if they were doing that to just protect their their guy or if it was true but they were like um they were like we just did this on our own well then we knew he would approve that's what they said right they said we knew he would approve but he couldn't it, it's also speculated that <laughs> that he was like so dementia out that like they did say that also. <laughs> literally they did say that also. Yeah. Like, 
they did say that also that he was in poor health during all this and he couldn't right. have made decisions. Right. So it's like, should he even have been president then at that point? Like, <laughs> what the fuck? You know, he's just privatizing. Like, man, he's just, uh, he's just, his brain is just mush and he's just fucking like <laughs> privatizing. And just like, would, would, you, like, would you like a jelly bean? <laughs> would you like a jelly They're like, shut up, sign this. Sign, sign this. this. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Shit. So, uh, yeah. All right. So I'm gonna try and find a real quick video, and then we're gonna we're we're gonna power down because I'm not trying to be on here longer than like you know four hours. So let me see if I can find a good video on JFK Jr. Uh, oh, well, let's let's see. Mm, no, that's too long. That's too long. Or something insane. <laughs> Imagine that. Where the fuck? Well, is Johnny it? did bring up kind of like a current day example with the whole Azov thing. Well, yeah. I mean, it's not the only example, but that. that no, is no, a, I never. Yeah. Singular example. Is that I wouldn't be surprised if there was some statute out there that is like you are not allowed to supply. This is out of your way is you a weapon for the expressed purpose of you know military or whatever like this and that's how they were doing it with um nicaragua also they could still give them things they just couldn't give them arms and they couldn't even follow that fucking rule they were like no we have to give them guns. no no that's part of the deal you don't understand yeah. <laughs> that's right this bill makes jello jelly beans free mr president uh, are you sure <laughs> yes yeah, sign it Sign it. And he's got a handful of pocket full of loose jelly beans, and he's like, "Here." All right. So, I mean, we could watch the the uh, internet comment etiquette guy on it, but that's like half an hour long, and I don't feel like sitting through that because I want to watch Mando with my wife. So you're all just gonna get the the shorthand. All right. So Pat, uh, let me just pull up. Uh, the guy in the middle. What the fuck? JFK Jr. Right. This guy, right? This guy, right here. This is JFK Jr. He's dead. Long dead. He's been eaten by crabs long ago, right? Nothing left. The crabs have been eaten by crabs. Yes. His his the the crabs that ate his dead fucking corpse in have been eaten many times over. Yes. Their corpses they, they've been actually eaten. probably been caught by like, you know, fishing vessels and eaten at Red Lobster. Uh he was six one, right? I hate and I hate lobster. I hate all that shit, dude. I'd never eat it. Dude, what's wrong with sea bugs? Sea bugs are cool. So gross. They, it's so gross. I know, I know. It's because you're vegan. So we're going to unmute tab and we're going to... What? I just had some good tofu. I know, I know. But th this is who they think JFK Jr. is. The middle guy. <laughs> hey, Jr. Was... I can't believe you survived the plane crash. CPAC 2023, JFK Jr. Tell us how you did it. How did you survive the plane crash? God bless you guys. We need you. We need you to carry on the torch. It's your blood, young blood, we need. Thank you. And it, thank you very much. How did you sur survive? Thank you oh, so yeah. Much. Are, are, are you him? Because a lot of people believe you're JFK thank Jr. You are, you, so are you him? Are, yes, are you, or no? yes or no? <laughs> yes or no? <laughs> Yes or no? Yes or no? <laughs> we really appreciate it. But we did really you, need a yes did or JFK no. Did JFK Jr. die in a plane crash? Yes. We have to get a yes or no. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Some help? Do you need help? <laughs> Close it, yeah. The only thing that was weird was that he was... I'm 6'3", and JFK Jr. was 6'1", and I'm much I know, but to me. think... To, you don't have to look for every single right. problem, right? right? You can just believe it. Right. You're here with JFK Jr. <laughs> so are we doing anything special on Friday? Um, yeah, yeah. Friday is uh, the panel episode. So uh, who here knows about Pat Sox? Who here likes Pat Sox? Now, my name's Pat, and I have several pairs of socks. No, Some not of that kind. I'm more partial to than other. Are you referring to my personal collection of socks, which does contain some very endearing pairs of socks? Pat, do you, do you, how do you feel about the, 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 the movement of patriotic socialism? Mostly by white guys that think that there's nothing wrong with America, and America actually good, in fact. Uh, I... 
especially let's consider our current little stretch here of doing um, investigations on Korea and Guatemala <laughs> and many other things. Are you asking me if I've come to the overall conclusion that America good? Yes. Johnny, I regret to inform you that I <laughs> don't think that I've come to that conclusion after a series of very intense days of investigation. So, um, do you think uh, uh, Stalin or, or Lanin would think uh, America good, actually? I, I, I think it's pretty evident that Stalin and Lenin... Uh, neither of them thought America good, but I think there's a deeper, um, I think there's a deeper investigation to be had that regardless of what they thought of America as a country, what would they consider about the process of decolonization? Like just because you have a geopolitical rival, right. just because you say that they're not good, you would have to kind of take it to the other side to see what their specific writings and actions were pertaining to decolonial movements, right. not just outside their sphere of influence but also within their sphere of influence so we're, we're we're going to delve deep deep into the historical figures that uh you know many people like you know uh the spankinator spanky ham himself uh maupin right have quoted right uh we're going to go into the historical figures that uh you know short king has himself has quoted we're going to go into the the figures that a lot of people like to to cherry pick and decontextualize uh you know to uh, kind of back up their like dumb settler bullshit right we're gonna have a panel of the cast of the decolonized buffalo rick and plants fanon will be on here we will have uh, our very own uh, uh twitch's very own <laughs> red falcon on here as a uh, part of the panel of people yeah, yeah 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 you're gonna lose your fucking minds you're gonna lose your goddamn fucking minds all right and you're gonna have two white guys and two white so, guys and two white guys just to you know i mixed but like come on and we are the two white guys we, we are, are the two white, white guys um, so <laughs> we're going to sit patiently and be just verbally abused we're gonna play devil's advocate, and me and Pat are gonna take the role. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> I, can't, I can't. More white people clap. <laughs> yeah, I'm very. I'm interested in the conversation because I, this is something that I was always found very endearing talking to, um, you know, Victor and Rick and Plants. Um, it's just kind of like you know where this like you know where the the Venn diagram of you know, native political ideologies and Marxism intertwine, you know what I mean? And where they are complementary to one another. Right. You know, and uh, I, I think that there is a lot of people that may not have read nearly as much as they should. And that maybe the whole like, you know, Stalin did nothing wrong meme kind of has a little bit of a blowback to it and you get people that kind of are just like well as long as they think Stalin good then like I should probably agree with them I should probably listen to them as like a source of information I mean they're quoting Lenin I mean like why would they quote Lenin out of context for this thing right and I don't understand anything about indigenous societies because as a leftist I've never made it a priority for me to learn anything about like you know indigenous history right or like first nation sovereignty or independence or anything like that and they're all dead why should I care about like you know what they think so, yeah, we're going to go into a lot of stuff about that, right, as if we haven't before, uh, and we're going to hopefully, you know, have a succinct panel discussion, right, uh, that will remain as a VOD for, like, what, like, two weeks or something, but it'll be on the YouTube after that for, like, many years, for many young baby leftists to, to see and hopefully help guide them on their political journey and not have any regrettable hot takes that they need to hide on Twitter or anything like that. Yeah. I, th I think that's fairly succinct, right? Mm -hmm. Do I have Prime? What do you mean, like Amazon Prime?
Um, I don't, but my wife does. Why you ask? Oh, thank you, Maverick. Hot take, I added too much curry paste to this soup. Oh, thank you so much. Oh, that's very hot, man. Chimera Machina. Come on, Sebs. Tell me. Tell me! I want to go watch Mando with the wife. If you connect your Prime, you can have two-month VODs as an affiliate. Oh, seriously? All right, yeah, no, we're 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 gonna do that, and I, I don't care what anyone's opinion is of of Star Wars related anything. That's the one th you should never do this with Star Wars, and that's trust what someone else feels about Star Wars anything, especially if they say they're a fan of Star Wars, because it's the one thing that all Star Wars fans do is hate Star Wars. All right, the fandom menace, exactly. So I think that we've we've done a pretty good job of uh, you know doing a, our first official Gladio episode, right, Pat? Yeah, I would have liked to have done better personally. Hey, look, that's the thing is we're we're always gonna get a second shot, just like the CIA. <laughs> Did the CIA give up? <laughs> no. <laughs> first time they tried to assassinate Fidel Castro? No. Did they give up the second time they tried to assassinate Fidel Castro? No. Did they give up the third time they tried to assassinate Fidel Castro? No. Did they give up the fourth time when they tried to assassinate Fidel Castro? No. Did they give up the fifth time when they tried to assassinate Fidel Castro? No. Did they give up the sixth time when they tried to assassinate Fidel Castro? No. Did they try to give up... I mean, did they give up when they tried to assassinate Fidel Castro on, on the seventh time? No. Did they... <laughs> did, did, did they try to... Did they give up the, when they tried to assassinate Fidel Castro the... Uh, the eighth time? No. Did they give up when they tried to assassinate Fidel the, the ninth time? When they the tried... The, there was a knife the, time? I'm sure the, that they had to use a knife at, at some point. At a knife? I, I thought I said knight. Like, I mean, they definitely tried to do it. But like, the, the ninth time? No. Did they Did they try to give up? Did they give up when they tried to assassinate Fidel the tenth time? No. I, I think we've all, all had enough. All right, okay. <laughs> Knife time. I'm in the process of opening a bunch of Haas debates where he potentially covers this situation so I can try to, like, extract some of his positions. Uh, from what I can recall, the best one, but uh, it's a couple years old at this point, is the one with Jason and Ruhu. That's the one I just know. Yeah. It's literally open in my side yeah. thing right now. Because that's the one where, like, he literally shows his whole ass that he doesn't know how, like, any of it fucking works. Yep, and that's the one that I'm. That's the one that's hovering right in front of me <laughs> that I will be using. Because <laughs> this was following, I believe, something he might have said to Luna Oi. I believe, oh, right? Definitely. That's when I drew the drew the line in the sand with those fucking people, yeah. where I was like, "This no. is fucking whack." Yeah, no. Okay, and like, I was sliding away because, like, I heard Jackson Hinkle debate Vosh about Syria, right. and I was like. This seems pretty good. And then he debated Dylan Burns, and I'm like, this dude's a fucking idiot. You just lost a debate about Taiwan to Dylan Burns. How? How do you do that? And, well, the thing is, is that he didn't even really rely on anything factual. It's like he just tried to, like, posture, like, masculinely posture yeah. over it the whole time. Like, almost like he was going to fight him yeah. or something like that. But that, that was like, his dude. thing back then. That's what he did on, like, a regular No, but this was Jackson. What? Jackson Hinkle, yeah. Jackson Hinkle? Not Haas? Nope, Jackson Hinkle debated Dylan Burns on Taiwan. How tall is Jackson Hinkle? <laughs> Where's his height? Is he 4'11"? There's no way. There's no way he's 4'11". Nah, shut the fuck shut up. The fuck the, up. The bread too no, come on. No, come on. 4'11". He's lying. <laughs> no. <laughs> There's a picture of him and Haas standing next to him. Next to each other. Well, right? isn't isn't Haas like fucking you know? Like, I think Haas is like the same height as Destiny. I think there's a time where they like stood next to each other. Look, look, look. <laughs> <laughs> Can you pull this picture up, please? Yeah, you know it. Fucking where the fuck is this? All 
I don't know how much light this sheds no way. on everything. No way. No way. <laughs> so Haas is how tall again? He's, I don't know. he's like 5'8", isn't he? Clearly the t the shortest person out of them. If Haas is 5'8", that means Jackson's 5'9". That means me and him are the same height. No way. And that's with shoes on. What about this one? Because we can definitely find this guy's height. Look, I'm, I'm sorry for any of our short kings out there, you know, that like this is like maybe like making them feel like some kind of I'm way. Or something. Yeah, Pat's 5'9". I wouldn't want to fight Pat. Pat would fucking wreck me. But I think I could there take him. All right, so now we just need to find out how tall Jordan Peterson how is. How tall Jordan Peterson, that's what we need. Six foot. Six There's foot. no way. No way. So that means that Jackson's probably like 5'11". All right, wait. So Reddit is saying he's like 5'7", and also calling him a cuck, right? And then you've got Click it. this picture. Click it. What? Click the fucking, the fucking thread. Let me see what it, there's, there's a picture. Yeah, Destiny is taller than Haas. There's no... <laughs> but Jackson Hinkle is taller than Haas also. What is going I mean, on? Destiny looks like shit, dude. Yeah. He does not look great. He, he looks like he's having a rough one. I mean, like, look, Sebs. 5'9 is shorter than me, but that's the same height as Pat. 5'9 is the average height of, <laughs> of, of a male in the United States, okay? It is not short, but it is not tall. Uh, in, Seb's in Peru. 5'9 is probably above average. Right? Actually. In Knowing how Peru. Pat fights, I'd honestly prefer the yeah, four. 5'4 is the average height in Peru. There's no fucking way that Haas is standing right next to Destiny. The average Peruvian man is five five. So if you're five and I in Peru, you're 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 tall. There's no way in hell. Hell yeah, Robo Gaming. Five nine alliance. Alright, and, and you can be a short king, like a real short king. Not not like these people. Both of yeah. these are are short peasants not short kings they <laughs> they are short serfs all right like the the you know are tied to the land not like the average sized <laughs> lord that i am right right you know i, I don't know i don't know if i would say i'm a lord uh, maybe like you know like a duke or something call them serfs yeah well i mean like yeah that i'm not calling myself a tall king like a tall lord uh, more of a a tall duke or like you know like a Damn, there's a couple tall kings in our chat. Like a, a tall, like, you know, what's what's another one? Like, there's like... Duke, Squire? S no, Squire's like... If you're like the assistant to a knight, right? <laughs> well, dude, we're going like, down the hierarchy. Like, like, <laughs> probably the hierarchy. What do you want me to do? <laughs> All right, that's enough. That's enough. All right, chat. <laughs> so, Friday, we're going to have a panel. It's going to start at 6 o'clock p.m. EST. You better be here. Yeah, I'm a tall Earl. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> so Friday, 6 p.m. EST, we're going to have a panel discussion. Would Stalin, would Lenin support decolonization? We're going to put the final nail in the coffin of, you know, the, the whack sock fucking bullshit that's been going on for well over the last year. Yeah, That'll be the end of it. It's not even relevant anymore. And we're going to make sure it was, stays irrelevant. I thought that was like two years ago that that was even a conversation. We're going to make sure it stays irrelevant. And we're going to make sure we put the final nail in the coffin so that no other person can try and develop this weird fucking grift into anything else. We're looking at you. I wonder you know. if like 
through this because you said that that Haas was like potentially going to debate Rick. I wonder if because of this panel, we'll actually hit the radar of a couple of those guys. We're probably going to hit the radar. So mods, I'm going to need you more you think, than ever. <laughs> you think they're going to? You think they're going to do a react to us? Or? Oh, probably. I gotta, I gotta get my pump on. I got, I gotta make sure that like you know I. <laughs> I gotta get some creatine before Frank. <laughs> Make sure I'm like popping a little harder. <laughs> oh my god! So it's gonna be fun. It's gonna be a fun time. Uh, you know, please make sure you 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 stop by, tell your friends. It's it's gonna be pretty entertaining, and uh, I'm hopefully this will be our first like panel thing with like way more guests than we've had so far on um you know. Twi uh, on OBS instead of doing the other way around because I think they all are on Discord so it'll be interesting so yeah no I'm going to be doing a lot of pull ups and push ups before the stream I'm going to do nothing I'm just going to continue to do what I do I know Pat has confidence he's not insecure like me <laughs> yes yeah there you go Red Wizard you got, you got the right idea going to need the edge you know before uh, going live just like all those like uh, fitness subreddits. So, all uh, right, I think that's it. Who's online right now? Lennon Smash, Dark Native. Mm. Who do you guys feel like? I'm thinking Are either you? Lennon. Who? <laughs> Eat lots of pineapple. <laughs> Do you want to do uh, Lennon? Yeah. Right. Just to make up for that one time we forgot. Seb says Lennon. Oh. The people have spoken. You heard the people. Takira said they're going smash either way. <laughs> Tropico time it is. Enjoy, everybody. Have a good night. Uh, see you, you know, on Friday. Very see excited. you on Friday. 6 p.m. EST. All right. It's going to be it's going to be interesting. Thank you. Thank you for being here. Thank you for choosing us to spend your afternoon with. Have a great night, everybody. All power to the purple. I can't hit the thing because the Lennon Smash thing is still there. <laughs> it's just masking it. It's niche. La Salam. Stay La strong Salam out now. there. I'm like.